friends and colleagues. Welcome to the 68th event of the webinar series on the rethinking city, especially the rethinking the Indian city. As many of you know, in half that is Habitat Forum and its multiple partners has been running the series for the past 18 months. In the previous 67 webinars, we have had some 350 urban experts, professionals, and specialists sharing their views, ideas, and perspectives on more than 40 themes and sub-themes. The webinar series that we are running is an integral part and feeds into an initiative we have launched last year called City URI, Citizen Urban Initiative. It's about a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort spearheaded by some of India's concerned urban related professionals, development thinkers, and practitioners to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the complex urban challenge in a way that ensures productive, inclusive, sustainable, livable, and human cities for a happy people and an equitable and harmonious society. Reassessing India's urban challenge, number one, rethinking Indian city, number two, and reform reformulating response in the context of the national development challenges and market, we're not talking about only urban challenges, is the task. The series that we are running is in response to an understanding that India's urban systems are faltering and our cities are not necessarily in good health in many respects, be that environment or water or sanitation or governance or finance or institutions or slums or sustainability or mobility. It's a seemingly endless list depending on where one starts and what the vantage point is. However, with all those challenges and the climate change knocking on the door, if not already in, both the short-term problem solving and long-term planning must reckon with the sustainability framework. With the cities contributing 65% to national GDP already, and urban population growth estimates suggesting 870 million people in the cities by 2050, almost doubling of the current population in 30 more years, India could ill afford un underperformance in addressing the complex urban challenge. With all this, cities will need to be rethought and reorganizing. Changing all this is no small challenge, even if COVID-19 shock leaves us with a new mindset and a fresh resolve to pursue our challenges. This webinar series is seen as an opening, much needed societal dialogue on how we handle urbanization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of economic growth minus the exploitative instinct and damaging traits such as widening and deepening inequality and high carbon footprint. The goal is to aim for economically productive, socially just, politically participatory, environmentally sustainable and culturally vibrant cities. Also, 
technologically adaptive and people centric. A webinar is just a platform for conversation and sharing ideas. Much more is to be done to take those ideas to the cities and the streets and the people. Also to the government at the city, state and the national level. They are engaged in meeting the demanding challenges, solving difficult problems and finding workable solutions, contributing to the societal partnership in meeting the urban challenge is the objective of this effort. And we know very well that we are nowhere near where we should be. More effort, more support, and greater engagement is needed. Today's webinar on conservation, conservation regulation and urban planning, the third on the subject, attempts examining one more aspect of the urban challenge and the way to dealing with it. Before I hand it over to one of the anchors of the today's webinar, let me introduce Punamji Punam Verma Maskrinhas. She's an architect, building conservationist, researcher, and writer with three decades of domestic and international experience. She's the founding director of the Goa based award winning studio, Akinova Environs. She's also the co founder of Goa Heritage Action Group and serves on the first Scientific Council Steering Committee of ECOMOS India and the Senate of SPA Vijayawada. She is the author and contributor of numerous articles and books related to traditional buildings. Thank you, Panamji. Now it's all yours. Thank you, Kirtiji. And I'd like to introduce my co-anchor, uh, Vinayak, before we begin with today's session and welcome our panelists. Vinayak will be joining us shortly to well, but he'll be here with us. Vinayak Bharne is a practicing urbine and city planner in Los Angeles, USA, an adjunct associate professor of urbanism at the University of Southern California and co-director of the India Netherlands based knowledge platform, My Livable City. He wears many hats. And as we go forward, a detailed um, introduction of each of our panelists will be added to the chat box. I begin with sharing of my screen to kickstart today's very important and very exciting conversation. And I'm really thrilled to have my friends here and, and really looking forward to hear their thoughts right across the world. We are still waiting for Ashley uh, DeVos as well. And as uh, we proceed, they will be joining us. So I begin with sharing of my screen. I hope everybody can see the screen. Thank you. To us, InHav web series on rethinking cities is the most appropriate platform to discuss conservation regulations and urban planning in retrospect and prospect. This is the third webinar of the three part series. And a detailed concept note was shared with our eight panelists and is now being posted on the chat box here. So I'm going to keep my provocation brief, focused on our collective memory and aspirations. Yes, our built heritage today is cumulative result of 3000 years of creative articulation in varied traditional materials through the length and breadth of the subcontinent. We dedicate our session today to the generations of craftspeople who have left us this treasure to be discovered, engaged, 
conserved and emulated. 3,676 of these built buildings that dot the nation are centrally protected. 5,000 about are state protected monuments. And we now have 46 Ramsar sites in India with four latest editions. And these are natural sites of exceptional value. While we have 40 World Heritage Sites recognized, recognized for their outstanding universal value by the UNESCO mission. But it is the status of the remaining, largely unprotected, by conservative estimate about 100,000, both natural and built heritage, that engages us today in this forum in retrospect and prospect. I invoke with reverence memory of a few of our heritage conservation stalwarts. Mr. Sham Chennani was among the first activists who initiated the heritage conservation movement in India in 1977. He had been active in getting the Mahabaleshwar Panchakani Bell declared an eco-sensitive zone. Sham, who passed at the age of 67 in 2010, was one of the India's most fearless, principled, and effective fighters for public good. He was at the heart of Bombay Environmental Action Group, to which Mumbai, Sham called it Bombay, owes Sorry, almost Poonam all to... of it. Your slides are not changing. Yeah, I have paused it. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Insight into the legislation is the key to long-term protection and the very first heritage regulations for Greater Bombay came into force on 1st June 1995. Sham realized that the action group success in Mumbai could be emulated elsewhere in India and this led to the legislative initiative in Pune, Mahabaleshwar, Goa, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad and elsewhere. To this end, INTAC published an abridged version of his seminal book, Heritage and Environment, 2007, to encourage more states to adopt conservation legislation and listing to protect the great mass of India's heritage. Martin Singh, Mapu, to many of us who knew him, saw the need of empowerment of Indian professionals and in the field of conservation and laid the foundation of both Charles Wallace Trust funded scholarship for two architects each year and long and short courses training opportunity for art conservator in the UK. The scholars of the first batch went on to set up master's course in conservation of heritage building in School of Planning and Architecture Delhi in 1987. Since then, Number of institutes providing specialized masters has grown to nine and counting in the country. Jitendra Pal Singh or John Saab to us was the intact Jaipur chapter convener for early 80s onwards and perhaps the very first heritage enthusiast who recognized that heritage was as much part of a city infrastructure in a historic city like Jaipur and was instrumental in establishing it so when he gathered the team to undertake enormous task of heritage conservation as a component within the first ADB funded Rajasthan Urban Infrastructure Development Project in the year 2000. The team with Shirini Mish Patel and Parul Zaveri, it, the lead, established that the conservation of built heritage can very well be undertaken under government projects while requisite inclusion of traditional technologies and specifications in the civil works compendium and appropriately order, altered contract conditions are observed. Nimish Patel and Parul Zaveri and a few more have established the relevance and continuity of traditional practices by engaging the craftsmen for their new built projects in historic context and thus gave us another dimension of continuum, that of knowledge and capacity of continuity. Professor A.G.K. Menon spearheaded the dialogue of the unprotected and thus came in Tech Charter in 2005. And there are so many others whom we owe much and now it is our turn to rebuild 
on this strong foundation of ethos and commitment to the cultural heritage of this nation and beyond. An important tool came in form of Constitutional 73rd Amendment Act passed in 1992, came into force in 1993. It was meant to provide constitutional sanction to establish democracy at the grassroots level as it is at the state level or national level. Amongst other key objectives, one is to promote bottom-up planning for which the district planning committee in every district has been accorded to constitutional status with clear mandate on inclusive, integrated and participatory planning for both managing resources and spatial development. The 74th Amendment made similar provisions related to urban local governance, the Nagar Palikas. These amendments to Constitution of India have paved way for activating potential of community participation in both the responsible planning and mindful caretaking at village and at the urban level, which should then inform the state's regional planning policies. The resistance to this move by respective politicians all over India, except Kerala, is really detrimental to its resilience against ensued climate crisis. Thus, we collectively aspire for conservation that is incremental as in that which enhances livability and allows for creative rebirth of good old known practices to deal with continuous transformation which are ever dynamic in nature. And development that is ecologically appropriate. Land, rivers, fields, forests are all valuable resources and not commodities. For all life to survive, sustainability is basis and not an alternative lifestyle. Each of the states of India and their settlements are a repository of knowledge system for respective climate and resources to support life and living. The human sustenance needs to align with the natural laws of cyclic and closed loop evolution. And thus the key questions that emerge. How effective have conservation regulations been over the past 25 years in India? Where have the specific successes and shortcomings been in this regard? What alternative initiatives to formal regulations does the Indian context present that may be worthy of broader application? And by what means and methods is the development of India being shaped? Does India support an inclusive planning for process? Do city planners and policy makers understand their deeper role in this dialogue, not as passive thinkers of politically correct rubrics, but charged activists and advocates of practical methods and initiatives born directly from India's socio-political realities. Is it any different in any other parts of the world? What can India emulate that serves the nation and its historicity? So here we are with our eight panelists and we shall be listening to individual contribution for about eight minutes each and thereby thereafter we'll have a round table moderated discussion we now begin with heta pandit i invite her heta pandit's first real job was with famed ethnologist dr jane goodall on chimpanzee research station in Tanzania, East Africa. Traumatized by the riots in 1993, she left Bombay and went to Munar first and then to Goa, and where in the past 21 years has written 10 books and is working on three more on Goa. Welcome, Heta. Over to you. Thank you, Poonam. And thank you to Kirti Bai and all the organizers and the team behind this uh, webinar. I'm looking forward to listening to all our colleagues and all our friends also uh, on the and to voice their concerns, uh, perhaps echoing 
ours in Goa. I'm going to start with my chimpanzee research experience and how I got involved with architecture from there. Because there were, when we were in Tanzania, there was absolutely no housing left by the African chiefs. Because everything was in wattle and daub, and the termites had finished off their history. And that got me thinking when I came back to India that architecture or built heritage was actually evidence of history. Then I, in Bombay, I cut my teeth in 1982 with Shyam Chainani. Everything that you spoke about him, Poonam, uh, is true. But it's also true that his success depended a lot on the bureaucracy in Maharashtra. We had world-class bureaucrats at that time. I worked very closely with Jamshed Kanga, Cyrus Gastar, D.T. Joseph, uh, Dave Mehta, all these stalwarts who were then placed in government and who understood the beauty, the value of good urban planning of architectural built heritage and of preservation, conservation, restoration. Our first campaign was to save the Central Telegraph Office. So that started the ball rolling in preserving government buildings. But see the advanced thinking of the bureaucrats of that time, because I'm talking about the 80s in Bombay. They thought that they should start with government buildings because they had, those buildings were completely under their control. And therefore, preservation of High Court of Bombay, the uh, GPO, General Post Office, and that got the ball rolling and it percolated downwards from the top. Heritage regulations, we started with the Bombay Municipal Corporation and with Jamshed Kanga as the commissioner. He set up an informal meeting. He set up an informal committee. We had draft after draft after draft for three years. And in 95, as you mentioned, the regulations were framed. And it was in those days quite the norm for bureaucrats to advise the ministers and not the other way around as it is today. Now, fast forward to Goa. When I first came to Goa, I, I thought the same template would work everywhere as Sham had taught us to believe. It worked in Hyderabad, but it did not work in Goa at all. It fell flat in Goa because here the bureaucrats were, in quotes, either on retirement postings or they were on holiday. When I first went to see the Tanjim collector, for example, North Goa collector, he said to me, I've only come here for the view. They were not at all interested in heritage, in conservation, in even knowing one, one iota of what value we had attached to this history. And it's a very, very uh, valuable history in Goa. What not before colonization also. Colonization, according to me, is recent, 451 years old. But before that, there were many, many kings who ruled over Goa. And they have left their own uh, uh, historical evidence behind. You will recall that in October 2000, we did a listing of uh, the heritage buildings in Panjim to start with. Because as we had learned, that we should start with the capital of the state. And Goa is a state, not a town, by the way. Everybody refers to it as a town because it's so small. So Poonam and I, to let everybody know, we sat with a gentleman, uh, an engineer, in the town and country planning office, and we made up a list of some 350 odd houses and buildings, the description following the impact format. That poor gentleman, Instead of the government appreciating the listing exercise that was done in collaboration with the town and country planning office, that poor gentleman was transferred to a remote area where his children had to walk miles to school. That has stayed with us even today after 21 years. 
because it's the same kind of callous, indifferent behavior that we are facing even today. Subsequent to that listing, we have tried to frame conservation regulation year after year, tried to persuade every chief minister, every town and country planning minister, because the bureaucrats have no teeth over here. That's the fact. We, have, we did a book on Tanjim entirely on our own steam, with our own funding, or with donors. And this is the second edition, which Poonam has curated. It's uh, called the Map City of Panji Goa, which was brought out in the year 2017. This has a draft regulations, which have never been notified, but informally, uh, I'm happy to say, that the mayor of Panjim, he refers to this list whenever something comes up in the city. Because Rohit Montserrat is a gentleman who is sort of conscious of what the city should look like. Not because he has a deeper sense of conservation, but because he's traveled abroad a lot and he's seen what's happening everywhere else in the world. So this is the status of uh, our conservation regulations at the moment. One example, let me give you, I don't know if you're aware that in Old Goa, we are facing a very serious problem of uh, an illegal structure. But before I go there, let me tell you that all our engineers and architects in Goa have for years, at least 26 years that I know of, shown the plinth of a small structure on a piece of land and then applied for repairs and uh, alteration permissions. So those permissions given by the town and country planning department with the permission, with government sanction, have built larger bungalows on the same plot. This tomfoolery has been going on for 26 years that I know of and has probably gone on before that also. The same thing they repeated as a template in Old Goa at the World Heritage Site, not realizing that it would blow up. It's imploded. We are in the 23rd day today of a chain hunger strike at the site. And rest, we will not rest. I'm speaking on behalf now of, of uh, the Save Old Goa Action Committee which has spearheaded this movement, and we as Goa Heritage Action Group are supporting them. We're not going to rest till they demolish. Why have we taken such a hard stand this time of going on a chain hunger fast? Because 14 permissions are pending in the same line along the river Mandovi, next to the St. Kajitan Church, which is a World Heritage Site. If this continues, it's going to become a... a Rapid urbanization is going to take place in Goa. We are seeing it every day. Hills being cut, rivers being polluted, lakes being filled up for construction for colonies. And it's not going to stop unless we do it now. The time is now. This is, and they, they had, it was a small 40 foot on this particular case. 40 square meter small loja is a small hut made for storage of firewood. We used that and showed a bungalow three hours away in a village called Perne and said, this is the bungalow we want to repair. Please give us repairs and alteration permission. Permission was given and this bungalow, they're currently owned by a lady called Shaina NC, who happens to be the spokesperson of the BJP, is uh, the owner of this bungalow. She may or may not stay as the owner, but that doesn't matter. The point is that they are, there is a plan to turn Goa into like a tourism hub. Rapid urbanization uh, and occupation by the, let's say, people who arrive in Goa by helicopters. This is the current status, and these are our concerns. I'm going to end this now and leave it open for question and answer in the discussion session. So thank you once again for having me on board. Thank you for the sharing your angst and the stories of Goa. I now invite Dr. Malini.
Krishna Kuti. She's joining us from Mumbai. Dr. Malini is an urban planner and wide experience in spatial planning in India. She's extensively working in Bombay now. Malini, over to you. Thank you, Poonam. And uh, a warm, uh, a very good morning to all those who are who part participating and who are here today. Um, thank you also to INHAF for uh, organizing this event. Um, so, um, you know, it was really interesting to hear um, Heta um, describe, in a sense, makes it easy for me to kind of respond to why is it, you know, uh, conservation and conservation um, practice or conservation of our heritage is so endangered today in, in, uh, uh, in India. And as, a, as an urban planner, uh, as a practitioner, um, I would say that, you know, if I, to, uh, to answer the question, how effective, you know, after 25 years since the first uh, regulations were brought in in, in Mumbai, in Mumbai um, we've not seen many cities take on and have adopt these heritage re regulations for their own cities. So if we look back, you know, how effective is this tool of heritage conservation regulations? How effective is this, is this instrument that we have as a master plan, you know, to manage or to respond to the conservation um, uh, I, uh, imperatives that, that face India? So I would say the short answer is it's not very effective. And the reasons are like primarily, I would say three of them that I want to foreground. Firstly, that very, like I said, there are very few cities that have heritage regulations in place. But what is even more interesting is that out of the 4,041 statutory towns that we have, and they're all supposed to have master plans, a third of them don't even have master plans. So, you know, firstly, we look, the master plan is obviously the best frame, the, you know, on a spatial platform, the best regulator, the best legal instrument we have to manage, to, to uh, conserve uh, built and um, natural assets in our towns. Yet, the master plan itself is not in place in many of our towns today. After so many years from, you know, since independence, we still don't have that frame itself. Um, having said that, you know, if you don't have the master plan and you don't have heritage regulations, uh, how do you then manage um, heritage assets? Um, how do we, why is, why is, why are we in this situation where we expect bodies like INTAG, bodies like Goa Heritage Action Group and citizens groups? I mean, the very fact that the first time we've had, uh, the, when the first regulations come in in Mumbai, you have citizen action spearheading this. You know, why is it that planners don't take this on? And I would say that the key here is the fact that you have urban planning a practice that comes out of colonial, uh, the colonial times. The fact that it is a, an in, um, a discipline that comes, that is primarily rooted in modernist planning principles that actively does not value traditional indigenous um, settlements. It is not coded into the planning practice itself so much so that your heritage um, the assets, the historic cities that we that India has, and so many of them, um, were looked at as problematic. They were looked at as centers of disease, as you know, as uh, dense, compact um, areas that need improvement. So, if that is where your modern planning impulse, you know, what is it trying to do? What is the modern planning? Um, ideals that you know the the, the practice that the practitioners are trying to they are trying to change what they see as problematic historic course. I mean, our traditional settlements are to begin with, just like modern planning sees slums as something that need action, areas which do not fit 
certain normative standards of what is good, what is, uh, the, and these remember that colonial planning comes in as a way to control and order the native population. So we are continuing with that tradition of urban planning and very, very obviously, we don't have a response in planning. We don't start with conservation. We don't look at these assets as a discipline. I see that um, you know, a few of us might come in from whatever planning uh, education we have, maybe abroad, maybe our own um, you know, inclinations and interests uh, from maybe an architectural education. We, we have that, uh, there is some kind of study, if you've studied in India and Indian architectural courses, do focus on traditional settlements. But if you look at the planning curriculum, you'll find that, that there is a significant gap. We are not looking at our traditional settlements. We are not learning from them. We do not understand traditional urban systems, whether it's of water conservation, whether it is of um, you know, ordering space, climatic responses. So these are not what modern planners in India are looking at for solutions to the future. So this is, I think, at the core of um, you know, where the problem lies, that typically your solutions are, if you have an urban village in a city, you will put a lal dora around it because you can't apply your modern principles of planning on that settlement. And I think these are essentially what the issue is, that urban planning and urban planners see conservation are planners they look to them to come in later and do something. It's not something that is taken on. And so to respond to your question, Poonam, do planners see themselves as activists? You know, on a personal level, you will find a few planners who will start from a conservation point of view. Like I would start maybe from an environmental perspective, from a heritage, you know, conservation perspective, but it remains something that individuals bring into their practice. And it's not something by, whereas town planning is a state, um, you know, um, profession, and these are not coded into the practices of uh, urban planning. So I think this is a, a big gap, and this is not going to be easy to bridge. Um, so, um, you know, I want to put that out there. And having said, said that, I'll very quickly move to, because we don't have too much time, I want to move to, you know, the questions of what are the specific successes, if any, what are the shortcomings and how do we then go forward if this is where we are? And I would say listing is definitely important. Identifying your assets, understanding what we have is very important, but it only go, does, it hardly scratches the surface. In fact, it almost just having that list sometimes endangers the very assets you want to protect if you do not have that, uh, an ecosystem uh, that supports conservation. And by that ecosystem, I mean incentives, tax incentives, funds, very important uh, for repair and maintenance. Um, also a set of um, workers, you know, people who can help maintain these older building stocks. So a whole set of expert inputs and advice, skilled workers who are trained, you know, a lot of other things, and of course, community awareness. Without the community, community understanding why this is important, I don't think you will have that ground acceptance because regulations typically are seen as a nuisance. Anything that tells me what not to do, don't do this, don't do that. You know, Even plans are seen by the general public as something they don't want. So a heritage list is just a headache. You know, So we need to get beyond that. And I think for that, we need this ecosystem that supports um, what, why heritage conservation. I almost feel we don't even need the tag of heritage and conservation. It's more about uh, treasuring the and valuing the places that we have. You know, they are wonderful neighborhoods. They are great places. Uh, let's keep them alive. So this kind of taking care of your neighborhood is what probably where we should head so that even that heritage tag, that that terrible you know, kind of listing that hangs over the building owner's head is actually kind of um, diminished, that, that threat. 
And um, uh, so just the last thing that I want to say is that um, how do we go forward? What are the possibilities given the fact that planning itself is not playing that role? Um, in my own experience, I feel that where possible, where a new plan is being put in from through a bottom-up process, actually identifying those um, heritage environmental assets, you know, putting that on the plan for conservation, very, very important with a set of, um, you know, guidelines of how to manage uh, future growth. But apart from that, you know, is there a way that you can actually get funding? Nowadays, you have so many national schemes like Hriday, you know, is there a way in which you can not only get funds that way, but the Mosaires project in Kerala tells us that you could pool existing resources from various departments and come together to create an interesting project that is through heritage, like a, a conservation led development. Um, so that would be the second thing. And lastly, through my own experience as secretary of the MMR, the Mumbai Metropolitan Region's uh, Heritage Conservation um, Society and the Environment Improvement Societies, I think that there is a need in every local body, or at least through some state intervention, creating a corpus fund um, to set up a society, to set up societies like this. Uh, that fund research, documentation, and enable projects. So we do. We, it's, it stands as a singular model. Uh, it's been around for 20 years. It's the state's or the city's best kept secret. Very few people know it. But there is funding for individuals, for uh, organizations to apply and get fund, uh, get funding for environmental projects and heritage projects. Um, research, documentation, the works. So uh, MMR, EIS, and HCS have actually uh, enabled listing for the entire metropolitan region. So they, we've played, played a very proactive role, but having this corpus was very wonderful. So the idea of setting up this kind of board, some money that enables people to, um, to actually try to at least start by documenting and then doing research on conservation um, focused projects would be great. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. I think my signal is also uh, dipping. So I'm going to keep my video off. And I now invite our third speaker, Professor Basu, who's joining us in Kolkata. She's an architect, urban planner from IIT Kharagpur, and has been very actively teaching as well on online platform, doing courses. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. As in my uh, screen Pass has it. been shared? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I can't see that. So, um, just, just a moment. Oh. Uh, Ma'am, we can see your desktop and all the pre presentation. You can start the presentation. Oh, I'm not able to see it, so I don't know. You can start sharing your screen again. I'll stop your screen sharing and then start again. Yeah, please try to do it now. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. You can see your screen. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Actually, Malini, what I totally agree with Malini, what she has said, and this is, she has summed up very well the major issues. I'm talking in continuation with that almost, that sharing some of the uh, cases where we have been involved with as a project and a town planning level. Uh, so, uh, 
um, like I'm starting with the uh, Vishnupur, uh, which is a tentative wall hater sites, and there are clusters of terracotta temples and laterite temple groups, and uh, which are very important uh, from the various perspective, not only built heritage, but natural and also cultural heritage. There are beautiful sculptures all over uh, the temples. Uh, they are uh, uh, the protected by ASI, but there are many which are not protected by ASI. They are important also for the social uh, and intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and as you can see the plan, they are, they are an integral part of the entire town. They are not uh, confined to one places. They are all over and some of them are leaving and some of them are not leaving. So the town itself is growing and there are a lot of water bodies and the water system, uh, which is developed by the Malla Kingdom, it was a part of the natural heritage and which due to the lack of understanding is uh, now declining or not taken care of probably. And uh, as you can see, Rashmanchu, which is here, and the, it's under Amasar Act. I will talk about that later on. But it is uh, there is no plan, and uh, the, there is a tourist influx, and one can. Uh, think that uh, if there is a world hitter site, it becomes a world hitter site, that what will be the problem? Because there are narrow alleys and other, and there are a lot of forest area in that joining area. Uh, some, a lot of initiatives have been taken, but still you can see that there are a lot of encroachments also. So it's not enough to have the rules and regulation, but the implementation is also very important. So in this particular case, of course, ASI uh, could, was able to demolish the encroach structure, their political intervention and other. I won't go into that. Uh, in India, we have a lot of structures which have been already talked about that there is a revised model regulation uh, statutory force, the model heritage bill. And also what is also important is the state town and country planning act, which are there all over, which itself can take care of the conservation and <clears throat> also for the cantonment area. So various states have been working towards it. Uh, we have seen for a lot of time. In West Bengal itself, there is a Heritage Commission Act, uh, which takes care of that. But what is the issue is that, as Malini already mentioned, that they are not, uh, they are not integrated with the planning process. Uh, and uh, this is what is very important, that it should be integrated as a part of the town and country planning laws and where the, the heritage areas or heritage precincts should be declared as a spatial zones and then how it can be in, included in the master plan. Uh, we know that the ASA no notification has done the Amasar Act, which is the 100 meter protected area um, uh, around the protected area. There's the prohibited area of 100 meter where no construction can be developed and the regulated area 200 meter. And these are very notional. I was there in the uh, NMA, National Monument Authority, for three years, and I could see that the law says that for each of the protected monuments, uh, there has to be a bylaws, which is site-specific bylaws, and hardly this has been done. And so they just bring for any permission, they just bring that uh, as a um, uh, circle around that, and they try to take the permission. So without actually site-specific bylaws for all this uh, heritage area, which I'm talking about, the ASI protected, and there are so many unprotected or state protected, uh, this cannot work. Uh, let's talk about the Bhubaneswar, which I'll talk about later. That Bhubaneswar also, if you just looked at the old Bhubaneswar area, this is what is happening. That this is the uh, buffer area, 100 meter, 200 area, and this is the old Bhubaneswar. So this has to be taken into consideration to integrate that into the development plan. Otherwise, it won't work. It, it's there just like island, which is really not. So this is an entire system of, uh, I'm just talking about old Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar, there are seven, eight zones, which are heritage zones. And uh, this has to be integrated without the master plan. The model regional town planning and development laws, uh, it provides three steps for administration of this law, preparation of the existing land use map, 
preparation of an outline development plan and comprehensive development plan and their enforcement and preparation of detailed schemes for development or redevelopment as envisaged in the plans and their envelope. So not only the regional plan or the master plan or development plan, it also has to be the local plan, which uh, we have seen in Delhi that in the new master plan, uh, it has not been incorporated. This is very important. Now I'll talk about the Bhuvaneshwar area that uh, uh, I take Kharagpur as a part of the team, where which is a multidisciplinary team. We had town planners, uh, transport planners, engineers, environmental planners, I was looking after the conservation. So it's an entire team of 14, 15 people. We're given the task by the state government to plan for the entire first Kotak Bhuvaneshwar uh, regional plan and then the master plan or development plan for two cities, the Kotak and Bhuvaneshwar. So just looking at the Bhuvaneshwar, uh, that entire area, we had identified seven, eight uh, zones, which are the heritage zone, which are integrated with the land use development plan, existing detail, it was done. And then also it was incorporated in the future land use plan. So one can see that this is the old area, Bindu Shagar. And so while proposing for the uh, future development plan, we visualize that the old uh, Bhubaneshwar will be the cultural hub. Whereas the, there are development on other sides and similarly each and every heritage zone area like Shishupalgaur, Dholgiri and other. So what will be the role in the future plan and what will be the land use, uh, what will be the natural heritage, everything was incorporated and detailed inventory was there plot by plot. And uh, this was, uh, I think this gave the blueprint for how Bhuvaneshwar and also Kotak would be developed in future, but the local area plan had to be implemented and they are in the process, I believe. So this is what, that this is the what the Amster Act says, but the entire Bhuvaneshwar old area, the core area, we had defined a core area and a buffer zone. Uh, area which has been incorporated and they are being taken into consideration for giving the future blueprint of the plan. So this is what that there are three different type categories with the three layers or levels of restriction or regulations that what can be done with the rules and bylaws and also the future role what we had said. I'll come to the other one. I made it very short, but uh, it was done for Manisha for all the seven, eight zones. Vishu Bharati Khoi, which is now it, this year, it has gone to the nomination as a World Heritage Site. Uh, this is again, not only important for Tigor's initiative, it's a university, which is very live university, but also the natural heritage, which is Khoi, and which is like a uh, laterite soil. And, uh, and then also uh, the pictures and other, and the natural heritage. So there was, a, and this is also cultural heritage because there are not only the urban, but there are a lot of rural areas, which is Srinikotan, which uh, Tagore developed as the uh, center for rural development and Shantiniketan is for the other areas. There, how the local people are developing. There is a lot of tourism pressure on that. Now, there was a case that this huge area, which is Kauai, which is a forested area, there are a lot of tourism developments were happening. So there was a case by the local people that no construction should be done there. So the issue there was how to define Kauai. What is the boundary of Kauai that was important? And so when it came to uh, IIT Kharagpur to give the plan by the state government, so even definition, delineation of the Kauai on a specific criteria very, became very important. And then how to integrate with the plan of the entire Srinikaton Shantinikaton development area, 33 villages, three municipalities, and the entire Vishwabharati campus became a real issue. So we also try to understand in the satellite images that what is the growth direction and how uh, the, the city uh, and the areas are growing, the entire area, and what is the development pressure. So to cut it short, that when we gave the planning zone for the entire area, we also had a planning zones with each, each issue of each one and the development guidelines for each one. Uh, and what will be the future direction? So there will be less pressure on the Kauai or the natural heritage. Based on that detailed 
uh, we don't call it master plan in West Bengal. This is a land use development control, LUDCP. And there it was done that how to guide the future development, including transport, sewerage, tourism, everything, and what will be the designated qua area so that it will be a totally natural heritage and control. Implementation is a problem. Tourism is a problem. So one can see how the mock uh, vernacular architecture comes up and there are two extremes. Uh, so again, coming to that is as mentioned, that is the community involvement and uh, the people's awareness becomes very important because we can see that in spite of this uh, regulatory authority and the plan, there are a lot of things which are happening which are not desirable. Trees are being cut, the roads are being widened, there are no urban design guidelines. So one has to go to the next lower level. I'll go to the other one where we were uh, involved, which is Kuch Bihar, uh, which is, you know, the uh, where Maharani Gayatri Devi came for, it was the kingdom, and where uh, it was not only the built heritage, it was, uh, we have identified almost 108 uh, uh, 120 or 30 heritage structure. But what is important when West Bengal government did, decided or declared two cities in West Bengal, um, one is Nodia, I will just cut short, one is Nodia, another is uh, Kuch Bihar. Uh, we decided that the, it has to be integrated with the land use development plan and the conservation should be a part of that. Uh, I think I will stop here. Uh, I also that there are many cases where uh, not only it has taken farther with the view control and other like the and also what are the incentives and other uh, and also it's this health thinking that how each and every zone has a character and how it if it is integrated with the development plan in the future plan then it this can be preserved and the city can function uh, still keeping the character and the preservation, preserving the distinct qualities of the heritage area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Basu. And you have brought in all the aspects that what we are expecting to see and what the big gap between what can be and what is, um, is, is just so, so disturbing and so mind blowing as well. I guess uh, there is a network issue with Kunam ma'am's connection. So maybe we have uh, next is Kiran sir. So you can start. Am I audible? Yeah, now yeah. you are. Yeah, 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 yeah you are. Uh, all right. So let me just say, um, Kiran, thank you so much for accepting actively in academics and journalism and he believes in activism through positive action. Taya is in the chat box. Kiran, please, let's hear you. Yeah, thank you, Puna. And uh, I think most of you uh, here, they know me, but for those who do not know, uh, I'll begin with a short introduction from where uh, uh, really this whole affair with conservation began. Uh, of course, it was at the undergraduate level that a French archaeologist whom we met in Mandu in the year 1982, and who had been documenting the place solo all by himself for the last 12 years, Mandu and Chanderi. Uh, he was a French archaeologist by the name Klaus Rodzier. And he used to give us pocket money and we used to go around uh, doing errands for him, collecting black and white prints from Mittar Bedi and uh, doing uh, a little major drawings in the towns of Wai, Verul, uh, wherever, you know, in Maharashtra that he felt, you know. And uh, he said that you people must understand and look at your architecture more closely and probably generate something that is more relevant uh, from that, you know, from those lessons. And he took me to Vishram Bhagwada, which is a very famous building in Pune, uh, of which I then did my undergraduate thesis. And now for the last 20 years, I'm helping uh, bring back that building uh, to what we think is a sensible conservation. 
so uh, my experience really stems from getting my hands dirty, uh, which uh, Professor B.K. Thapar, you know, who was the ex-director general of the ASI, and who while selecting us for the York scholarship said, Kiran, there are many uh, of these ladies who are now will join academies and the York course is more about you know, teaching teachers or training teachers to become conservationists and spreading the, the word very widely. But probably we need people like you who will get their hands dirty. And I can say after 32 years of uh, practice that my hands are really dirty. And I'm going to really share some of the experiences uh, starting with uh, going around in Pune with Sham Chenani and Heta Pandit uh, somewhere in the early 90s. Yeah, when Sham Chenani used to say that, let us get more and more buildings into the list, you know, so that if you have so much, probably only so much will get conserved, you know. So that was his logic. And they kept putting in buildings on that list. And the later reviewers who came to review the list said, building you know so there were there were questions being raised uh, that is without uh, a complete understanding or proper knowing of the whole history of the city and what it represents uh, if you just go on adding to your list uh, you're going to build up a kind of resistance to the kind of uh, conservation that one is trying to propose uh, very obviously Oh, well, uh, there are some of the positive and negative examples that I'm going to tell you about. I'm not going to share any slides or anything because it will get too much. And uh, I, I come from a city uh, which really uh, was Shivaji's birthplace and known for his guerrilla warfare. And uh, probably everyone in the city has got a little Shivaji inside him somewhere. Uh, probably there is a one in me also. And uh, we keep looking. Uh, for those kind of corners where the, the legal system and uh, the kind of establishment, what they want to purport or propose, uh, one tries to look for lacunae in that and, and make uh, capital out of it. You know? So that's a basic kind of uh, ideology that probably stems uh, and is part of the grain of the city. Uh, and I, I, I was really taken up by this Kalyan example. Very few people know that in Kalyan, the, the town of Kalyan, there was an example uh, that was given up by the, the, the residents of there. They did not start with trying to tell people how to conserve their buildings or what to do and how to do, but they collected uh, about 100 people who originally belonged to Kalyan and asked them to write their family histories. Each of them really went to great depths trying to write the family histories. And then they ask them to give 500 rupees each so that they will collectively publish those histories in a book, which really turned out to be a, a history of Kalyan, okay, the old hundred old families of Kalyan. And this was an example told to me by Dr. Srinivas Sate, who is a historian who lives in Kalyan and whose brother sculpted the first uh, Shivaji statue, which is in Delhi, uh, in the uh, Chandani Chowk uh, at that uh, you know, the city hall behind the city hall. And of course, he did the other great statues of Shivaji in uh, the Gateway of India and other places, even the Minto Bridge, the Shivaji is, is by him. So uh, this man uh, really uh, was a electrician, but who later on said that, okay, I am now going to uh, do uh, historic studies and conservation and things like that. And he has become a professional help for us when we do conservation on our buildings. Uh, so Kalyan is an interesting example, which is rarely taken by any other city, you know, like looking, the, looking at the people as closely as we look at the buildings, because people are much more important. And in all the development oriented, uh, you know, perspectives now that we see, uh, they are becoming more human oriented rather than physically oriented. Even what is the, the development index, the human, the HDI is what is called the human development index in that which is seen as a parameter of really judging development uh, is about probably education, is about uh, gender equality, is about health, uh, is about infant mortality or the, the decreasing rates of that. So we at conservation uh, as architects and as engineers and planners tend to look at the physical aspect of that more closely without linking it uh, closely enough with the human element, which is probably more important than, than the uh, physical development. And as we say in conservation that uh, having uh, the will of the people with you 
is more important than having somewhere written on a piece of paper that this legislation is important or that legislation is important. And uh, the attitude of the people towards legislation, which uh, some of my earlier speakers have already spelled out, has been of a, a rebel. Because the establishment was a colonial one, uh, there was great virtue and value seen in rebelling against uh, the statutes, which is what uh, probably uh, most of the people have been doing uh, most of the time. Take, for example, the elimination of the CSMT in Mumbai, the World Heritage Site, which we were asked to do uh, by the uh, railway authorities, the central railways. And we asked them, don't we have to take a permission from the Heritage Committee, since, it's, since it is a World Heritage Site and also a listed one of the Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation and all that. They said, Are, uske paas jayenge na, to kam se kam do saal lagenge uske. Hamara project to fir ho chuka. There was this meeting which was held with the chief secretary uh, at the Maharashtra government. And uh, he said that, just go ahead and do this work. Uh, initially, you know, there were some problems with the contractors and all that. So he called a meeting and he just said that, just go ahead and do it. Once it was done, Intact was up in arms. There were many experts who were up in arms. The people just loved it. They were busy taking selfies of that, that whole thing. It took us six years to get that whole thing done. Uh, but uh, most people were happy about it. We were happy about it. And we were very happy when Shankar Mahadevan on Facebook said, Are, I wish they do this to many buildings in our city. You know? So there was a kind of a populist versus an academic and a pro co-professional's jealousy that is involved in all that. You know, There is a very big element in all that. And it proved the law that when the, 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 the higher ups in the bureaucracy or the politicians want to get some new things done, they just put the laws aside. You know, you look at the Salman Khan case or whatever cases that you want to look at, and it proves the law that jiski uh, uh, you know, that is probably uh, our whole uh, system. I can see uh, Heta, you know, <laughs> uh, reacting to that, but but that's what it is. And I have seen it uh, the hard, the, the you know, look at looked at it the hard way. Similarly, uh, when I was working on this Mahabaleshwar Panchgani case, you know, where uh, for five years, we did a lot of work trying to, uh, you know, list all the buildings in Mahabaleshwar and Panjgani uh, because there was a show cause notice given by, given to the Maharashtra government saying that, why aren't you doing anything about uh, the environment in Mahabaleshwar and Panjgani? So uh, with Sham Chainani and all the other people there in, in the Heritage Committee, we did all that. And we saw that some of the best buildings, uh, they were pulled down and new structures were built in its place. And of course, a long uh, legal battle is still going on over it. And it was that Four Oaks property by a very famous builder here called Avinash Bosley. And, uh, you know, it was really sacrilege where what he did was unforgivable, uh, but the law couldn't really pin it down on him. That is the problem with the legal system and the rich and the powerful. At the same time, we did some very good work at the Club Mahabreshwar and uh, Sham was up in arms against us saying that, how, how come you did not take the permission? I said, I discussed it in the Heritage Committee. I was myself part of the Heritage Committee, but the Heritage Committee people, they sent me a stop work notice without my knowledge uh, to stop this work. So even within the Heritage Committees, there is this problem you know, of backstabbing which is very famous in Maharashtra anyway. And uh, so, uh, you know, this, this is some of our experiences. If we put them down, it really will be a kind of a conservation thriller, you know, since our profession doesn't happen to be a very exciting one. And it's full of these frustrations and uh, all these contrasts that we come across. Uh, but to take the story further, and if I have two minutes, do I have them, uh, Puna? Yeah? Um. Maybe a one minute. <laughs> okay, one minute. Okay. So I won't, won't go with all the stories uh, that, I, that I've related so far. Uh, but uh, now taking cue from the, uh, the larger perspective on uh, the religiosity and Hindutva and whatever you call it, the government of Maharashtra came up with an RFQ for calling conservation architects to do planning and design and conservation work for some temples, eight temples in Maharashtra, and we were given the temple of Khidrapur. It's a very famous uh, borderline case near Kolhapur. Uh, the ASI now sits on the permissions to allow us to do the major drawings. You know, so this is with the established, you know, real official government body 
there are problems with that there are problems everywhere you know in 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 the country because we are in a transition phase from the colonial to probably a self led kind of a governance with the bureaucracy which still has got many hangovers from the colonial systems and uh, you know like unfortunately it was imran khan who said that, that indian bureaucracy is full of small people sitting in big chairs you know so uh, i'm sure malini and hita and all of us they come across uh, such people every day on on a daily basis uh, but uh, I'll, I'll end with what uh, ajk menon said to us during the formation of the conservation architects community of india he said that look this european kind of conservation is not possible in india so let us not even hope and aspire for that ours is a kind of a, we should look for an equivalent of the ipl what they did for ipl you know they made it a very popular indians commercially successful very popular and all that kind of a movement if we can find out solutions like the ipl for our conservation movement i think we will be a thumping success for our next generation who are increasingly coming being attracted towards the profession but are being met with frustration at every uh second uh, you know project so I, i think we should if punam and this group and our whole thing is looking for a solution for that we must post our success stories we must look at our shortcomings very closely and with a very hard lens and come out with uh, a kind of a winning solutions uh, for the oncoming years in conservation thank you thanks a lot kiran that was really um charging i had to change my device so here i am i hope my voice is clear and and yes thank you deve are you ready yes you are as charged deve gupta is a conservation architect and heads the architecture division of intact new delhi deve over to you we can't hear you the way you're muted now now you can yes yeah so thank you thank you punam for inviting me to speak today in this forum um, as we were discussing in the practice session very very interesting but of course very complicated uh, subject but more than talking i'm also very happy to see some of my old friends and colleagues some even guides and mentors who because of the circumstances these days we are not able to meet uh, so regularly but great to see ravi manish kiran ji kiran uh, and, and dr basu and uh, many others so you know i mean because i think the sort of so called paucity of time uh, i just sort of jotted down a few random thoughts uh, on heritage and cities and perhaps looking at them from a distance of about 25 years so there are just about eight points that i like to make maybe a minute each <clears throat> and some of them are repetition of course and like marlene already explained a few and uh, dr bas is also mentioned and kiran also but i mean even at the hazard of repeating them maybe they will be reinforced so the first thing is uh, about heritage and sustainability where you know we generally tend to consider culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development but honestly i would be much happier to see it becoming a beam if we were to con uh, to continue the architectural assembly and maybe perhaps connecting the other pillars of economic growth social inclusion environmental protection and holding to the weight of the sustainability and i'm saying this because i feel that culture is one of the aspect that can be a cross cutting integrator to achieve a lot of sustainable goals that we talk about and they necessarily need not only be related to the environmental aspect but they have to cross cut into aspects of uh, poverty elimination education social inclusion health resilience and all that especially because i feel that you know it is inherent in heritage conservation to uh, come up with partnership collaboration of multiple and interdisciplinary approach that we all talk about unfortunately for us and malini had already said that 
as of now, culture is not integrated within our development uh, framework. And it's rather seen as an extra optional cherry on the cake, but never the cake itself. Of course, there are several historical reasons for it. One, of course, is colonialism. Uh, but I think more so it is much more related to that because now we have been independent for almost 75 years. But I feel that this is also much more related to the heritage or rather its absence in the discourse in our nation building and identities, perhaps stemming mainly from the circumstances of our independence and partition on religious grounds. Now, it's no wonder that we very quickly embraced the universal architecture and actually our dams became our temples of democracy. So there were some sort of these Newtonian notions that were sort of imposed on our very Einsteinian relatively relativity philosophy uh, that our culture represents, which were really, really alien to us. And a lot of solutions started to come from the outside, even for smallest of our local problems. And I think this is where the problem lies, that this has really led to the lack of confidence uh, in our own traditional technologies and heritage. And that's why we always are started to look at more engineering and solutions from the outside, uh, even for things that we have very local solutions for. Of course, I'm in no way discounting the modernism. It has a lot of important contribution in our context, but unfortunately, in all this heritage has been much relegated and seen as either as the baggage of the past or something so irrelevant and distant that it needs to be looked at either from kid gloves or from a distance in awe by some and even in disgust by some, as you have seen several examples in the recent past. And all this have really alienated us from our heritage. And this is not only evident in conservation, but much more evident in actually our school education system. Look at what our kids are really learning about our heritage. And I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but you can read other people. A very small example of this I would like to give you is um, of historic city of Tanjore, which we engaged for a very short period. Now this city is interesting because it has a cyclic nine months of drought and three months of flooding. And they keep grappling with this drought and flood. While when we surveyed this particular city, there was an unused historic moat around the Bradeshwara temple, which is the world heritage site. And it actually can retain rainwater that, uh, that basically is the reason for flooding. And it is really enough to cater for the water needs for the entire city for the entire year. But you know, the concern irrigation department is much happier to lay a pipeline of 50 kilometers to drain water from another distant lake, perhaps uh, maybe making a drought in elsewhere in the state as perhaps they don't want to get into this heritage mess with the ASI because like Kiran said, they were very afraid that ASI will never let them use this thing and it will perhaps take 10, 10 to 20 years to even uh, receive a reply from them who are basically the owner of these uh, more. But I still hope that this smart city will be smart enough to see this opportunity rather than uh, coming up with this engineering solution. Another thing I felt that this repercussion of this oversight has been, and of course, uh, not only that, um, there are several other factors of development pressure, migration, rent control, and all that. Then the heritage has been completely diverged from the urban planning or development uh, scheme, like Malini had rightly pointed out. As a result, what had happened that historic areas of cities have suffered from huge disparity even with basic facilities as compared to their greenfield counterparts. So much so that even in institutes offering both urban planning and conservation, the approach adopted towards historic areas in the curriculum is of complete contradiction. And I speak this in my personal experience as I have taught in both these departments in several architecture colleges. 
And while I mean, like, and there was a particular instance where I was taking classes in urban develop, urban planning and, uh, and in conservation. And by chance, they were looking at the same city. So while in the urban planning, they were conforming the historic city to the basic urban guidelines by widening all the city and demolishing large part of the historic city in creating infrastructure. On the other hand, the conservation people were wanting to just not touch uh, anything, even if it, uh, it compromised health and public safety. And there was no way that these two departments, almost sitting across the corridor, were able to even reconcile uh, their proposals. Of course, I, in no way I'm saying that we have not had successful examples. One can quote many. But unfortunately, they've been very sporadic. I mean, like Nizamuddin, Basti, Bhubneshwar, Pondicherry. Unfortunately, none of these have actually translated into a robust national policy. And each one of those have remained isolated examples in themselves. And one reason, an important reason for this is perhaps economics. I feel we have really not got the economics right of the heritage conservation. We are sort of still relying on activism and heritage as a charity uh, with a begging bowl. And that's another uh, way, in another uh, reason that it is really, I mean, we are not really respected in a way. Like, I don't think that doctors have to fight for hospitals as much as we need to fight for conserving historic building. Of course, I mean, I may be comparing apples and oranges, but just giving an example that of another example of how heritage is not really integrated within the system. And having said that, I think without attractive financial benefit, I doubt very much if heritage conservation will be much successful even in the future. However much we try to push this alternative of intangible benefits of social inclusion, and uh, what not emerging out of it. And this is where even I bring the heritage regulation in picture that the present incentives or the economic incentives of TDR and tax rebates are, have also been had very limited applicability and does not really make heritage conservation more attractive, financial feasible, especially in the tier two and three, where there are no TDRs or tax rebates to really benefit out of. Even in cities like um, Ahmedabad and Mumbai, TDR is hardly a compensation and never uh, incentive or, uh, because you're really giving, uh, the transferring the development rights, which is like a compensation, not over and above what the heritage value would be of that particular asset. Does heritage benefits, be it in terms of environment, social, or cultural values, need to be translated into economic terms, even if it means that we, um, the carbon credit that we save in conservation are put in particular economic terms in our projects. And I think if you look at the West, one of the success story has been the amount of reuse that they do for historic buildings. And perhaps because you've not got the economics right, the evidence of this is really the limited use of concept of reuse in historic buildings in creating both physical, social infrastructure in the cities. Even when it makes logical sense, both from economic and environmental perspective, and, and really is a low hanging fruit because these buildings are standing and can be quickly restored for several of uh, these functions, but we still have a tendency to build fresh or convert even brownfield projects into greenfield. As recent examples of Varanasi and New Delhi and even Leh have shown. I mean, these are lost opportunities with several of these historic areas. The cities could have really shown the way forward. And reason for this is perhaps the same lack of confidence, but also limited creativity within which the conservation professionals also really address this matter. When we talk of reuse, our solutions have mainly revolved around museums and or hotels and sometimes shopping. One, I do not know of many examples of reuse of historic buildings as schools or hospitals or even social housing to cater for the increased demand in the housing. And I think it's time that even in profession that we start seeing heritage as an asset and not a liability. And that perhaps will change something. 
And I think for the profession, we also need to really rethink our approach to heritage conservation itself. We, we really need to start seeing heritage as a network or a system touching all aspects of our lives. I think we've segregated heritage into silos with the artificial distinction of natural, cultural, artistic, tangible, intangible. But this is not how we actually experience it really. And we tend to celebrate a few isolated icons while relegated many more to be of lesser importance. Even our listings tends to be more selective and indicative than being more uh, inclusive and uh, more participatory. And imagine what if this same approach was used in the nature conservation where only a selected few best tigers or elephants or only a few species were considered for protection. We do apologies to George Orwell. I would like to really question if we have unwittingly created an animal farm for heritage. And also most of our heritage regulations are really top down and really imposed from the top. And like already Malini has said that all regulations are a bit of an irritant, but we do credit to, of course, Shan Chinani who had really pushed it. But having said that, a lot of his initial work has now been started to use as a cookie cutter approach where what was relevant in Bombay is being sort of imposed in Leh, Nagpur, Nasik or Gurgaon or I mean, which perhaps is may not be even relevant. Unfortunately, the heritage regulation put much of the onus of conservation on the owners of the heritage property. And like I said, without giving much technical or financial support, and it really does not distribute either the risk or the benefit evenly amongst the stakeholders. And that's why perhaps it had had limited appreciation and application. And lastly, I think heritage cities are inherently more economically productive, environmentally sensitive, sustainable, culturally vibrant, people-centric, and all the other things that Kirti mentioned in the beginning. But I think it is for us to really push heritage at center stage by mainstreaming it. And one way is, of course, to start creating local solutions even for global challenges like climate change. And I think heritage is our hope for the better future, and we need to stay invested in it. Thank you once again, and we we'll look forward for further dialogue and conversation on conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, I was to use that line. Thanks a lot, Deva. You brought in. Um, I'm so glad that it's it's real uh, discussion, you know. And these are very very valid points for because if we don't discuss them, how do we go forward? And with that, another discussant. Welcome, Ravindra Gundu Rao. He is a civil engineer from Mysore, planner alumni from SPA, Charles Wallace Fellow, conservationist of historical building. And he loves to conceptualize, detail, organize engineering, training, project management, and more. Over to you, Ravindra. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Heritage is uh, an important component of the settlement planning. That is the broad theme here. Secondly, legislation regulations are at two levels, one at settlement or precinct levels, and the other at the building levels. So my experience is large, largely with the latter, at the building levels. Uh, at the settlement level, already uh, Shankamitra and uh, Malini and others have uh, uh, spoken. It's a more complex uh, planning oriented issue. And I do like to believe that the, the second part, which is the building related regulations and etc., are much more doable uh, because uh, the, the uh, pandribles are few in number. So, my own experience is with the uh, largely with the private sector, uh, un, unprotected monuments people who essentially valued their own property one way or the other, and at public buildings with the ASI and the city corporations, et cetera, uh, not a very pleasant one. And then there are the semi-public ones with the trusts, et cetera. Uh, so these are all essentially building-related repair restoration works. My approach never changed. 
it, I mean, I never had to worry about this because it was all based on, guided by my education and my training, and which I firmly believed in. And therefore, assuming that my footing was on the right platform, I hardly had to worry about regulations. Not to forget that my much of my work was the pre-regulation talk era, except maybe an odd situation where we had to add some structure uh, in the existing, uh, you know, a little uh, to the existing heritage building. There, some obviously the planning regulations were uh, required and were attended to. Now, my approach was very simple, which was intuitive. I would invest a lot in explaining the principles of conservation to my clients, regardless of whether they were housewives or Maharajas or somewhere in between. So it was pleasurable because for me, it was reenacting my own education to explain with great joy why a certain thing can be done only one way and not in several ways. So, and I had, frankly, I had very seldom any difficulty in doing so, mostly because I had some very learned, educated, and cultured clientele. And sometimes, even if they were not, in my opinion, I found it quite easy to explain to them by the scientific reasoning of it. Uh, I would say that has been my uh, foundation of my career. And my observation is that the state-owned buildings had maximum deviations from the principles slash regulations. I just believe they're the same. The principles regulate. So that was, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's not obvious, it's not, not my observation, but I'm talking within my own practice. I could not help but notice if I make a, 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 a survey of it, uh, the deviations were mostly in the state sector. Now, the basis of regulation is customs and practices, whether it's a, you know, uh, any law or any legislation, which is regulation is based on customs and practices. And, uh, and that's why, uh, and the, the, it is the, the accent is on to guide and to control. Now the problem with the latter word, the control is instinctively disliked. So because it has a negative connotation and it has uh, basically it has a punitive or a dispute resolution kind of a meaning to it. So when you talk about control, we talk lawyers and stuff, very unlike undesirable in any context. Um, regulations when derived from the people works very well. This is what I observed in my, my English days. People stand in a queue because they accept it to stand in a queue. People don't spit in Indore because they accept to be the cleanest city in the country. So there is no regulation. They don't need to put stickers on the wall saying don't spit anymore in Indore. Uh, and whereas you, in many other places, you can have as many stickers as you wish, it doesn't work. So it's only regulations are only as good as the culture of the people. No, the culture cannot be legislated. It can be inculcated. Uh, and now, so what do I learn from all this? First of all, the formulation of regulation, reg legislation, et cetera, et cetera, I'm again talking about the building level should be, and it is possible to make it extremely scientific in reasoning. There is hardly, I can't see a any single example why we cannot explain the basis of a regulation of how a certain building can be restored in only one manner in that city, in that location, in the geography. Uh, and the ability to communicate the same to all sections of the society will make sure there is absolutely no need for legislation in the long run. Um, to involve all sections of the society to formulate these uh, is, is a key, as we already talked about economists and sociologists. So to make them logically relevant to the local people. Yeah, that's another thing. When Because I've been hearing about uh, legislations at a, a national level, I can't see 
uh, for my life, how it'll ever work. So it has to be uh, very geographic specific. The building restoration of Dharwad region has almost nothing to do with Goa or uh, Assam or wherever, except the principles. So that I wrote again, the principles are static and cast in stone. They cannot be and shall never be like classical music. A, a certain raga has only seven particular manners of doing it. There is no space for arbitration of it in any manner. So it's only, but the interpretation of it depends on our honesty. So it is really left to the, um, you know, somebody, somebody can always argue that Kalyani can be sung another way. And uh, it's for the others to take it or leave it. It because depends on the honesty of purpose and the latter cannot be legislated. Two more points. State agencies are least equipped to form legislation and regulations, even and especially in heritage conservation, which is probably the role of conservation specialists. When I mean conservation specialists, I have a difficulty in defining them. Is it by qualification? Yes. Alone? No. It could be. Um, I don't know how we can uh, get to that, but I go, I guess it's not so difficult. Mysore Maharaja never had difficulty in having the right advisors. So how we did it, I don't know. But they had the right people, the corporators, some of them were barbers, tailors, and scholars. But they all met eye to eye and had no difficulty. Uh, conservation specialists, by education and dedication, I said, I don't know how we go to quali quantify that. And social scientists, and even it occurred to me, politicians, I just wrote within brackets the good ones. Um, please find one. And lastly, it would suffice to a great extent uh, to display, you know, to deploy conservation specialists in projects that will take care of regulation by itself. It's a sort of, I'm, I've gone back to my first point that let's say we have a, a, a dedicated, knowledgeable conservation purpose doing the project, where is the need for a legislation? Because he or she is going to follow the principles, whether you ask them or not. So yesterday I was in some meeting, uh, something came up with some, a very renowned person using a particular technique, which the person who was selling the technique apparently said it is patented. I said, now, I have the age and my maturity to tell the gentleman, I can't use your technique. It may be the best in the world because my principles, my education tells me that if you're not sharing the technical details of your patented, we cannot do it. That's it. Because it may well be the greatest possible bus that I miss, but I would rather miss that by, by not, I would rather than miss it rather than skipping my education and qualification. So I conclude, that it's all possible because now there are many more people. So from the era that when I started um, working to now, there are, I mean, a few hundred of them and it, is, it shouldn't be so difficult to, uh, to conserve heritage buildings in the correct manner, which is the gist of legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for being on the, your section of exactly in that and laying the onus on the profession and the professionals. I really appreciate that. Now I would like to invite Ashley. Ashley, are you with us? Ashley DeVos, Hi. trained as an architect, mm -hmm. landscape architect, and as a conservation and heritage management pro professional. Ashley is faculty and council member at University of Morutua and has 40 years almost of teaching and uh, working experience from across the world. And we just can't wait to hear you. He's joining us from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Over to you, Ashley. Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the, my picture is not coming on for some reason. <laughs> so uh, you have to imagine what I look like. I think that's, that's the most important part. Of it. Uh, Many of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you today uh, has been already covered by Malini, uh, Professor Basu, Kiran, Dive, 
and also Ravindra. So I'll be just sort of going through it from my observations of India. I, mean, I don't know India so well, but it's just uh, my observation. For example, uh, if you look at the subcontinent, it has a historic development that evolved throughout a couple of thousand years. It has changed, adapted, readapted to suit different political upheavals, but it arrived today as a tangible expression seeped in intangible and symbolic meaning. The Mughal period may also be recorded as a colonial invasion. Even though the intervention adapted in some small way elements of the ancient tradition. Historic environments help preserve memories that we of today are expected to hand down to the next generation. It is not the case of keeping everything from the past, but making careful and informed judgments based on values and significance. Education, understanding, and intuition matters. This and only this will sustain any regulations and any public support. The buildings at times may be arrogant statements, but they were mostly built for people. Architecture is people. If the people of today don't want it or value it, nothing will preserve it. After all, People created cities, not cities created by, for people. The European colonial efforts, especially those of the British Raj, created new spaces called cities in new areas where others did not exist, often surrounding or adjacent to their army barracks, totally neglecting and allowing further decay to set in to the traditional native cities. It permitted the existence of the old walled city to explode in a restricted space, while the British Raj city had well laid out streets planted with trees and edifices protecting a different lifestyle. Now, our education system, as we all went through the same type of system, is very colonial in its thinking. And therefore, after our training and with this colonial mindset, we fitted, Ill, we fitted well and sought after the Europeanized spaces in the British Raj city, rather than neg further neglecting the old city, allowing it to crumble, explode, and disintegrate further into a non-understood mass of humanity. It is what the British Raj wanted, and they have achieved it. And Marlini, I think, mentioned a lot of the problems of the inner city. Conserving cities in Europe or even USA would be comparatively easy as one is working with buildings and spaces of a single thought process, which may be neglected today, but recognizable. In the US, the motor car and its ex exponential development that encouraged the spread to the suburbs left the inner cities neglected. It is the same with South America, where traditional spaces have been neglected and a few educated class prefers the extension of Spanish and Portuguese concepts. What of India, for example? The present thinking on heritage, it was mentioned very carefully by uh, Professor Basu, is based on conserving the British Raj city and some of the Mughal monuments. She spoke of her work at Bhubaneswar, especially the Mughal as funding is available. And there was a lot of people who mentioned funding, which is an important part of the conservation process from organizers, organizations like the Arkan Foundation, who have supported the rehabilitation of mostly the Mughal monuments and gardens. Adaptive reuse and renovation, which should have been a continuous in maintenance process, now neglected for a century, has drawn the attention of all interested in conservation. Many, many are exposed to this in a way forward, also in, a, in our elitist architectural courses in, in India and also in my country, for example, where, and wherever the British Raj existed. I mean, our, our teaching has been very elitist and we have been taken away from the real essence of the people of the country. Edifices like the Taj Mahal, for example, and other Mughal monuments were elevated and given prominence during the British Raj simply because the British could and preferred to relate to the concept of a separate monument instead of a cultural landscape. The sites are easily controlled 
They stood tall in an environment devoid of encroachment, and the British saw the beauty in them simply as single monuments akin to the follies at the bottom of their own landscape gardens. When does not say, see anything special, I, I personally don't see anything very special or great about the Mughal Taj Mahal, ex except for Fatehpur Sikri, which is special. Uh, it is essentially a fortified city and has been the capital of uh, Akbar's uh, empire for 15 years. It was certainly exceptional due to the high amalgamation of traditional ideas and details using traditional artisans and involving local expertise. In contrast, the Taj Mahal only records the existence of a Persian building, a concept translocated and built, embellished by locally trained craftsmen in subcontinent India. Are there other conservation prospects besides the Mughal tombs and the cities forced on and constructed by the British Raj? Of course, there are the myriads of Hindu and Buddhist temples that dot the subcontinent uh, landscape. What is so Indian of the central area that Lachins created for Delhi? Is it representative of India? Does it extrude an Indianness? Unfortunately to me, it does not. It is an imaginary Raj interpretation of British Raj greatness. And this is as viewed by an outsider like me. It carries some motives, but does the motive concretize a culture? It certainly doesn't. Instead, the design is required to infuse a spirit and a soul of what India should be. Unfortunately, the British Raj Delhi does not project that. Any conservation of British Raj would only keep the achievements of the British Raj alive for the next generation to see and perhaps enjoy. Is this what India as a proud nation is striving for? A collection of commercial buildings born out of exploitation, the conservation goal? Many spaces, including the traditional wall cities, are presently neglected and is steep in human history. Solutions for each of them have to be site specific. They need infrastructure, and the organization of the essential services and help to understand and identify the inherent values that would support and consolidate these special spaces. Educating the residents to understand the inherent values Looks like we have lost Jim. Ankisha? Yes, ma'am. I think we have lost. So we can lost the voice, right? We yeah. seem to have the connection. Yeah. Maybe we can move ahead now. Yeah. Just give him. Six seconds more. Yeah. Sorry, back again? Yes. Okay. Permit me, if I will, may to digress for a moment. If one had the privilege and opportunity and were permitted to choose a traditional building typology and environment that is a complete expression that grew out of the subcontinent, it not, would not be any of the Mughal monuments. I'm talking as an outsider, right? and not that of the British Raj either. Instead, one would concentrate on the step dwells. They have a soul that is so Indian. Gujarat has a couple of hundred of the best examples located along the caravan routes, some descending many hundreds of feet to retain and maintain the precious life-giving water. Many are unprotected, neglected, and badly used because the knowledge imparted to the general population concentrates on the fantastic Taj Mahal and similar structures as being special and worthy of protection. Nobody talks about the, the, the real India. You know, we are talking about something very different. But these step dwells are unique in the use they achieved and fulfilled. The solutions are homegrown 
have a great functional purpose and have a proven expression that has been neglected. I am excited that the ASI, though I mean, I mean, we have the same problem with the archaeological department because I work with them in Sri Lanka as well. They are an arrogant group, they, but they have restored a couple. One should have a system by which all the steppers should be protected, restored, conserved, and presented as a unique example of the great Indian architectural tradition, which has evolved through town, through time, for the simple temple kun, all built by indigenous entrepreneurship and local artisans. It remains to me the greatest tangible architectural expression to humanity. And it is, in my opinion, it adds to the India's greatness. Now, I basically, I took it away from the town, though I was first trying to get it to talk about the city and so on. But there is a lot more of India in the rural areas. And Professor Basu and people like that have been working on it. You know? And I think if you are going to project India, to me, it is not the colonial India. It should be traditional India. And tra for traditional India, we should be looking at the old cities and see how we can improve the lives of those people. I think there, there was mentioned Malini and so on was talking quite, uh, quite nicely about it. I mean, this is because that's the people. They are the people who did most of this work as well, you know, and, and they are worth looking after. They are worth preserving as people because they are India, not, not those who live in, uh, in, in British Raj India. I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but as we, we have all become very elitist in our thinking, and we prefer to be living in British Raj India and not in the old cities and so on and so forth. But that to me is what India is all about. And unless we can work out a conservation system for the old cities, we will never solve anything because that's where the people are. And if conservation and architecture is to do with people, they are the people we have to approach first. Thank you. We hear you, Ashley. We hear you. Manish, we are now joined by our next panelist. Manish Chalana is an architect, historic preservationist, and an urban planner with a PhD. He is Associate Professor in Urban Design. Over to you, Manish. Thank you. Thank you, Poonam. Uh, thank you for including me in this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, I've, uh, you know, there's so much that we've all heard and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm still processing. So I really don't have a lot to add because I think all of you stole my thunder, which is, which is a good thing uh, since there's not a lot of pressure on me to bring in new points, but I, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't practiced in India uh, on, in conservation. I studied in India. Deve was my classmate. Uh, that was 25 years ago in SPA. Um, and since then, I have been in the United States uh, studying, teaching, and uh, working in this context. So, so I have a different vantage. Uh, I really, in that sense, do not have my hand sullied or dirty in, in, in the practice. So um, I'm not the fish fish in the water, I'm, I'm the fish outside of the water. So maybe my vantage might have some, uh, some insights for, for you all who, who have to do, you know, deal with the bureaucracy and other systems uh, that uh, make your work uh, uh, more difficult and challenging. Um, I was thinking about it and like they were, I just noted down a few points uh, and I took advantage of 25 years, I think, since we were in school. Uh, a lot has happened in, in conservation in India in, in the last 25 years. And of course, it's not perfect. There's still you know, uh, problematic aspects for all those developments, but we should uh, you know, spend a couple of minutes to, uh, to process that. One is you know, we've, we've clearly expanded from the monument framework and are including more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, heritage presents. So yes, that work is small, but we are beginning to appreciate uh, history at a neighborhood level. And that gets reflected in the ASI uh, Amateur Act of 2010, which, you know, which protects the context. Again, not perfectly, but it, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction to think about 
uh, you know, 100 meters and 200 meters around Monument. So we're doing that, which is, uh, you know, a thread that we can need to continue to pursue. Um, and then that sort of, you know, because we are, we are valuing the ensemble uh, and that brings us into the territories of intangible heritage and landscapes, uh, you know, as well as the vernacular, which all of you have discussed. So are we, you know, there yet? I, I don't think so, but, but there is progress in those directions that we should sort of keep the momentum uh, going. Uh, the other area of, you know, uh, uh, development that I notice is in the education department, right? When we were in school, uh, they were, correct me if I'm wrong, we were the only school that offered a master's program in, in conservation. And now I believe uh, there are over 30 programs that are doing that. So of course, you know, there's more training, um, you know, not just through um, college uh, um, structure, but also through INTAC and its heritage training and other things. So we are becoming more professionalized we you know may not be there yet but we are in, on, on the path to to becoming that and intech has the academy you know uh, intech academy to train professionals in a range of you know uh, areas so there's also in the last 25 years greater uh, private actors and providers of conservation if you will multiple you know private companies are doing it one could argue that they're not doing, you know, not all of them are following standards, but there's still sort, sort of more activity in, in the field uh, in terms of, you know, their work towards restoration and now even in maintenance, which is, again, the, all these points have are double-edged swords because, you know, if we let private companies uh, maintain our monuments, then, you know, we are taking them away from the public realm and that poses another set of problems. Uh, uh, and there's more central government involvement in the last 25 years, right? Uh, there are initiatives uh, such as Hridhe, Prasada, and even Nuram had some potential and some space for uh, heritage to be uh, engaged, uh, but uh, it wasn't entirely successful. Uh, in the last 25 years, uh, I'm keeping track of time, in the last 25 years, there's also a greater global discourse because largely due to internet and we are, you know, like in this forum, we are talking from people from around the world. And, and you know, because of that, there is this, there's knowledge sharing and cross-cultural exchanges, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, there may also be more duplication and less contextualization of these approaches. So, you know, something that works in Seattle, or Washington may not necessarily work in Delhi or Mumbai, but pieces of it can be contextualized and may mobilized for, for the context. Um, so that's, that's happening. And, uh, but you know, uh, with all this, these developments, and I'm, I'm not gonna cover the rest in my notes, there's also, you know, a major uh, philosophical shortcoming in my mind. And it is because, you know, and it, some, some discussions may have alluded to it that we haven't been success, we haven't successfully been able to weave heritage as part of the India rising or India shining narrative, right? There's just so much rara around that. And, you know, it's, it's time to think about how India, you know, imagines its past uh, or how India sort of wants to present its past or itself in the smart city mo uh, model, right? Or, or the global city model, right? So we need to be thinking more about, more about that, you know? And so heritage continues to be uh, non-mainstreamed you know, in both design and planning. And the fallout is very costly and detrimental uh, because, you know, uh, it's the, the public by and large does not see us as having a conversation with the past about the future. They just think about it as they were mentioned. We're just sort of dabbling in this, uh, you know, uh, baggage of the past that has no relevance. And, you know, and we have, we're sentimentalists and anti-progress and we, you know, uh, just bring ourselves in front of bulldozers in the last moment to, uh, you know, uh, thwart uh, progress. So, so we haven't really been able to integrate it in planning as Malani and others mentioned, uh, we haven't done a good job in that. And there are models in the US that might have some lessons for that, you know, how to integrate conservation with planning. And that started in the US in 1966 with the passage of the National uh, Historic Act where every state had to create a state historic preservation office. And the state was then a liaison between the central government and the local government. 
And that was the structure that was created and there was flexibility built into the structure, but also the structure was had many rules and regulations to it. Second point is that what Divya was saying that you know, we haven't really been able to integrate preservation with economic development in India outside of the realm of heritage tourism. And that too, we are not doing too well, right? So if you think about how do we engage history and memory outside of tourism, not, not very much. And we've seen that tourism has had a, a range of detrimental impacts on, on, on the historicity of small towns and uh, cities in India, right? So we need to be thinking about how can we, how can we you know, make a robust, uh, not just a stick model, like, you know, you have to do this by these rules and regulations. I'll just take one more minute because my alarm went off. So I'm, I'm over eight minutes, but I'll take one more minute. So we need to have, a, have both a stick and a carrot model. So a stick model is, you know, there's a framework which is in place, but it's also a carrot model that, you know, incentives, like, you know, here's what you can, you, you are, able to gain if you preserve the the historic stock. And, and Seattle is doing that and I can share it with you. It's a model that says the more you save, the more you preserve, the more you get in terms of additional floor area ratio. So this is above and below the zoning of the neighborhood. So if the zoning is ground plus five and you know there's a historic building, if you just preserve you know the walls, you get a certain amount of uh, um, bonus FAR. But if you preserve more, you get more. So uh, the less you preserve, the less you get. So, and that carrot, carrot model has been very successful because there's a lot of money to be made from real estate if you, if you, if you do that. And I'll end with one, one more problem that I see that is rearing its uh, uh, you know, ugly head uh, is you know, the, the rising nationalism in the country. Uh, and I, I, I differ with uh, um, Ashley there that you know, I, I see uh, colonial, uh, Mughal colonial, colonial and British colonial heritage as traditional heritage, because, you know, what is culture? It's an amalgamation of, of culture. So it's, it's, par it's part of who, what India is. So I see the rising nationalism, you know, in, and in the way uh, the country's heritage is now being uh, imagined uh, as, as problematic. And, and you know, uh, it, it sometimes is push for preserving a certain uh, type of uh, memory and history comes at a huge cost to other peoples and religions, particularly Muslims and now more Christians. So, so we need to maintain equity and 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 justice uh, as integral integral to preservation. And and that's one of the challenges that I see uh, that as the field in India would have to have to deal with. So I'll I'll end there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Manish, for that. Um, you echo many of our, many of us who have similar concerns in present time. Dear Vinayak, I hope uh, I can call on you now. Hi, Manu. Uh, sorry for being late. I'm actually not well. Uh, sorry for the beard. This is not my normal look, but it's great to see you all and great to be here. I'm glad I could be here finally. So, <clears throat> What I'm going to do is, is summarize some of the key points I heard as we do in every panel, and I'll pick one question, one point that stuck, stuck, stuck out to me and, and have you emphasize kind of that in a slightly more elaborate way. So we heard a number of things, and my questions will sort of stem from this idea. You know, we in random order in no sort of uh, <clears throat> particular order, there were some brilliant points made. Uh, you know, conservation globally and certainly in India is at a crucible moment in its field. There's no question about it. And this was a theme that many of you alluded to. And that means a lot because it's been questioned. And that's a wonderful thing. Second, the rubric of conservation, the praxis of conservation now expands all the way from issues of social justice to climate change. And this is wonderful because it suggests that it essentially has to intersect with many, many disciplines far beyond architecture. That's amazing. That's fantastic. So that realization has been established as well. Third, the heritage enterprise needs to be much more systemic. I think that's a very important point that came up, right? That this, this, these are not uh, siloed issues. It's a much more systemic problem that needs to go beyond silos. That's fantastic. Practices need to go beyond the idea that a place is just safe and conserved. I think that's the point many of you alluded to. So that's another one to highlight. Uh, heritage is a collective action. 
I think we all know this, but we take it for granted, and certainly in India, where these are not mandatory ideas. So that's an important point to bring forth. Number six, the formal dimensions of placemaking are, are still prioritized 75 years after, you know, 70 years after colonialism. We, we, we're still obsessed with the idea that preservation is a formal discipline, which is not true. So that's a, a lot of things that were said about it. And finally, the idea that critique is not enough. Uh, that, you know, this idea that regulation doesn't work and therefore we constantly become rebels to it. So somewhere from there, uh, my questions will stem. If you, if you give me a minute and I'll, I'll pick the speakers in the way you all went. So I'll start with Heta. It's great to see you Heta again. Um, so, you know, I mean, you've been kind of stalwart at uh, the, the sort of uh, important reactionary, certainly in Goa, a place I was born in, by the way, and that remains very dear to me. Um, and thank you for all the efforts you've done there. But you've kind of been, for all the right reasons, you know, a reactionary to what has been institutional failure. Uh, and it continues to happen. And I'm well aware of what's going on in Goa right now as well. Uh, but beauty of a place like India across the whole is, and, and I agree with the way that, we, that we, we shouldn't be kind of using these terms loosely of intangible, tangible. I agree with that. But just to be simplistic about it, uh, I often find that it, it is very difficult to talk about uh, heritage in the formal sense in a country like India, and therefore we need reactionary issues because institutional formality doesn't work. But intangible processes that are often managed by people, by completely other different users, festivals, uh, rituals, uh, daily, seasonal, uh, are, are magically functioning in such beautiful ways. And you, Heta, all people have written about this in, in more beautiful ways than many people I know. So I wanted to pose and remind people of who you are and also ask you the question to talk sort of somewhere between these two, that while we may be reactionaries to one side of methodologies that might not be working, do you see uh, enormous potential and perhaps pointers on the methods that are working on the other side and how they might inform the other, going back to the West Point, that eventually we might want to think of these as not sort of separated ideas, but things that diffuse into one another. The, uh, the thing is that uh, we have been separating built heritage with intangible cultural heritage. That's first mistake. I think other speakers have also pointed it out. And I live in a world of optimism created by myself. I don't believe that uh, it will fail the system and the cultural backbone of Goa is so strong. I do believe this, that they themselves will, will rise and will the, the values that are instilled in us from centuries old, despite colonialism and rules by so many other colonists before the Portuguese arrived, that it will survive. The only thing is what I'm afraid of is what Manish pointed out just now, and that is growing nationalism. Growing nationalism in... Uh, could, could studio in half, please? Yeah, thank you. Great nationalism has raised a very ugly head in Goa recently. And especially with our elections around the corner, we are plan we are, they're planning to have elections in February. That is, they, they're giving out freebies to anybody who's in power, who wants to do, who wants to build in Goa without any regard or respect for the existing uh, heritage. That's one thing that's happening at one level. At another level, Vinayak, they are confusing Portuguese colonial built heritage or architecture with Christianity. Certain these houses that were built, for example, the houses that I documented in Houses of Goa that was published in 98 and subsequent publications that I worked on, authored, they all speak about Goan houses as being Goan. And yet, 
the government and the brokers, the land estate, real estate brokers, they all see them and brand them as Portuguese architecture. As a result of which government owned big, large buildings like the old GMC, which was the oldest Asian medical college, the Goa Institute of Management, which was the old Auspicio Real, the Adil Shah's palace, which was later occupied by the Viceroy, all these large edifices in Panjim and up to Rai Bandar and even old Goa, they're all seen as Portuguese buildings. They were emptied overnight. They are still lying abandoned. Abandoned, not used. Instead, they're building afresh, we're building new structures. And I feel that it's a deliberate attempt to abandon these buildings, make them useless, and then turn it into real estate. So as Divay was saying, we are in awe, we are in wonder, we are amazed, and we are also disgusted with heritage. The, the other, other thing they're doing is also turning it into real estate. Because once an edifice goes, gets into a ruined state, the easiest thing for, and if it's government owned, the easiest thing for government will, uh, will be to turn it into real estate. They'll say it's just land now. And the third thing is tourism. Goa is seen as a tourist magnet. It, it, the, uh, the Taj started it and, uh, in 72, 73, and it's still seen as a tourist magnet. And today we read in our newspaper that somebody said that all the churches should be seen as tourist magnets and churches should be turned over to the GTDC, Goa Tourism Development Corporation, and made into uh, tourist hubs. So this is where, Manish, I agree with you that, that this kind of thing has raised a very ugly head and they are on the, sitting on a, a time bomb where communal uh, issues will come up in a very ugly way, which has never Don't happened in Goa before. I'm going to come back to you on, on the point of intangible again uh, a little later, but we'll move to Malini. Uh, Malini, you know, the key point as a as an accomplished uh, sort of planner in India, you, you, one of your key points was about master plans and the nexus of master planning uh, with, along with conservation. And in, in my limited experience in India, I, I, I must confess, like Manish, most of my practice has been outside India, but uh, I've done some work in India and my experience in master planning has been like other parts of the world <clears throat> that are not Europe and not America. Uh, there are three kinds of master plans and I'm being simplistic here. There are some master plans, very few that are actually vision-based master plans where you, you're actually envisioning a place ba based on either a, a, a deep history or, or some idea that's, 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 that's really profound and, and excavated. There's a second kind of master plan that's purely data-driven. Uh, where you, you basically take raw data, you project, and you come up with something, typically landing up with land use, which I'll get into a little later. But the third kind, which scares the heck out of me, is speculative master planning. And I've seen this happening a lot in India, particularly in the small towns, where there is no data at all, right? So one of the questions I wanted to ask you is particularly as, as someone sort of like, you know, really with dirty hands in, uh, in, uh, in the good sense in Indian planning, uh, what relevance does master planning truly have in India? And I'm asking you this because it's always seemed to me that the real nexus of uh, urban planning and heritage in India probably lies in uh, trying to, uh, instead of being reactionary, trying to do the least possible change that we could do in the most important pulse areas and leave the rest to sort of the speculative forces that are going to take over anyway. But of course, I'm being provocative here because I have the right to say this since I'm ignorant of the Indian context. Could you shed light on that and tell me why I'm wrong or right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Vinayak, uh, thanks for that. Um, you know, if I look back on, uh, on uh, master planning, um, I've been asked questions of, you know, why would you... Uh, uh, why are you still hopeful, uh, you know, about this process? Because um, looking at master plans, you know, you always have this narrative that um, you don't understand uh, 
uh, what they're exactly doing. They, they seem to now end up just having this regulatory kind of a role. So they have moved away from thinking of a future vision or this idea of future proofing or even the original ideas of what a plan is trying to do. You think about some a place 20 years later and you try to plan for that um, for that time. Um, and I, I, I know the way I would, um, um, I, I, I always say that uh, what is nice about, uh, about working in, Mumbai, in, in India is that um, at sometimes, you know, and, and today in the conversation, we heard a lot about bureaucrats and polit politicians. And um, so what I found is that uh, it's also very easy sometimes to create big change. If you have, if you are able to convince sometimes just one key person, um, or you're able to push big ideas. So there's what in my experience, and I would say that the Goa Regional Plan in, in some senses, the fact that we could put on, um, you know, put on the platform and actually put on, a, on the spatial plan, this idea of conserving uh, eco-sensitive zones and, put 80% of Goa, at least try and protect the environmental, uh, the environmentally sensitive areas on a plan. You know, the, there is a certain possibility that exists within master plans. And I would say that um, as, as planners, what I find is um, that I still believe that it is the one tool that we have, the one state instrument that we have to be able to conserve and do this. Now, the gap that exists is that we are not, um, you know, the tools we have, especially after the, uh, after the um, Constitutional Amendment Act of 92, uh, the fact that if we can actually devolve and, you know, I, and I, I have to say that I, I learned a lot from associating with Professor uh, Edgar Ribeiro, who was also my PhD, um, external um, guide. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot to uh, to kind of take that on board. The fact that you need this devolution of powers, and if you're able to use that electoral board um, and integrate that, and you know, create these bottom-up plans, and then kind of actually scale up and create the district plan. So. Um, Puna mentioned that Kerala is the only place where we've seen some aspect of that. And I, and I think that there is really, I, I've also been having conversations with the Kerala planners who instituted these, um, Mr. Jacob Izo. And I am currently very interestingly kind, trying to help a very small uh, municipality in Kerala, Chittur uh, Tatamangalam, which is kind of resisting the draft master plan because it doesn't do justice to its resources. And um, so in all of these, you know, the point is that I keep trying to see how is it that you can have a conversation with the electoral ward or with the electoral uh, elected councillors. And if you're able to map and get them on board while you're making that master plan, you know, so the idea is that you typically these are all separate. You don't have the electoral ward representatives on your master plan process, they are not integrated. And if you are able to have these conversations early, and that's what we are doing in Chitu right now, that we are trying to get municipal councillors to, to engage and present what their ward needs. What are the resources? What are the sacred spaces? What is it that you want to conserve? What are the water bodies? We find that there's actually an indigenous system of, uh, of water harvesting, a, a series of tanks, the Aries not there in the master plan today, but can you integrate and bring it on board through the master plan process? And I think also uh, because Kerala has this system, so this district plan becomes this top-down kind of a large frame, but completely influenced. And there's a um, back and forth between the bottom up and the top. So, you know, these are, um, you know, they may sound idealistic, but right now I'm in the process of trying to really make this happen. Typically, what you said is right, that you know, it, we don't have enough planners, the plan is conceived somewhere else, uh, and it, you, you know, it's um, often drawn up in an office, 
doesn't relate to the ground reality, and it's mostly a numbers exercise. So huge limitations there. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll come back to you later as well. Uh, let's move to uh, Professor Basu. Um, and I want to focus on the issue of land use, Professor Basu, because that was a very dominant sort of theme. Uh, and I'm, I'll, I'll provoke the question this way. In the United States, and certainly in Europe, but more in the US now, uh, we've been questioning land use up top down, bottom left. We've been trying to throw land use in the garbage bin because we felt that uh, land use is sort of the biggest culprit that has destroyed everything. And, and I wanted to ask you this as an experienced planner because we felt that land use planning has this sort of uh, dangerous way of freezing cities, freezing urban form related to important uh, heritage assets, et cetera. Uh, whereas the truth of the practical issue is that the form of the city continues to evolve. So land use rules and land use regulations often become speculative rules because they don't, they don't help you predict form in even the places that need predictable form. So let me say it another way. The, the temples and the areas that you showed, for example, I would argue these are areas where any development needs to be predictable in the sense that it needs to be compatible and whatever that means, it needs to have some conscious effort. I'm talking purely architecturally now to the tangible heritage aspects that exist. Land use designations often deny us of this possibility unless they are included or, or complemented or supplemented by really intelligent uh, regulations that accompany them. So my question to you is, uh, is this a method you have tried in India? Are you supplementing land use regulations with anything else, any instruments or any tools that bring other devices of urban planning beyond land use? And what results and success stories could you share with us? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, what is my take is that the when we were students, the land use plan were done for 20 years. That long-term plan don't work nowadays. It has to be short term and it has to be more flexible as you rightly said that because it has to be more dynamic. Um, but at the same time, the, the development plan like different terminologies are used uh, in West Bank, all they don't say master plan, they say land use development control plan and LUDCP, uh, which has to be more a visionary statement, taking care of the existing situation. But at the and it has to be for a short term. It cannot long term vision must be there, but it has to be more short term. Another thing is that I at least uh, I, I agree that when the master plan is done in all the cases where we have done, it has to be in consultation with the people and with the municipality and the local representatives everywhere that was taken care of with the uh, ground reality and other. At the same time, once the vision, I mean, it has to start from the regional plan, then the development plan, but until and unless these development plans are uh, translated into local area plan with the panchayat municipality and the ward, and uh, it's translated into three-dimensional uh, and the uh, regulations. And like in Kuchbihar, for example, we just, didn't end with saying TDR. We said that which are TDR giving area and which are the TDR receiving areas. And so that the height, the land use and the overall plan, everything is that this is a broad brush stroke. And within that, the detailed uh, guidelines, local area plan have to work out. Otherwise it's not implementable, it won't work out. Thank you. I'll, 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 I'll expand on that more later, but we can, we can have another point from you as well. Uh, I'm going to move to Kiran. Uh, Kiran, you shifted the discourse of, Kiran, I there? Oh, great. You shifted the discourse of heritage into, you know, and what I thought was a beautiful anthropological question, which is you emphasized oral histories, for example, uh, broadening the heritage rubric. I mean, it was very intelligently presented and I, th I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And then the thing I was left with was, I mean, basically you were saying, we got to move far beyond architecture. There's a difference between historic preservation, which is now a term nobody uses except a few of us in the US, which we ourselves question to conservation as being far beyond the architectural discipline into anthropological issues, uh, ethnic issues, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question that I have for you is as a very experienced sort of practitioner and thinker, uh, have you, have you 
Do you have any thoughts about how the idea of regulation in relation to heritage, which often stems from architectural and even planning uh, dimensions, that you know we're building cities around heritage assets, so we've got to write regulations that deal with form, deal with policy. Um, is 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 a method of thinking about this the way you presented it to go far beyond that idea, to talk about the idea of policy not from an architectural or planning perspective, but from the issue of cultural management alone. That this is not an architectural question. This is not even a planning question. This is really a culture of cultural management, because the moment you broaden it completely then you can bring in numerous other disciplines and assets to it and change the process through which you operate. So any thoughts in that regard that going far beyond architecture or even city planning in that process? Mm, well, as, as I even said in the beginning that unless uh, this whole process is, a, is a culturally rooted and the people basically agree on certain principles uh, which should be followed, uh, there is precious little that bringing regulations can change. You know? uh, and what I have experienced is that, uh, you know, these uh, government led kind of projects, you know, uh, for example, uh, a thousand crore project is, is ongoing out, out of which about 750 crore is already spent on uh, one of the largest pilgrimages of Maharashtra, which is called the Wari, for example. Yeah. Now this Wari is, is uh, there's an extremely intangible heritage kind of a project where the government had not done anything like that before. And they started on, on it about 12 years ago. For three years, they just groped in the dark to know what to do about the Wari, you know, because it was just poor people who just got together and walked 250 kilometers to Pandarpur and from there back, yeah. And uh, after groping, they found out that the places where they stay, uh, where they drink water or have their food and all these things, uh, they are uh, underserviced, yeah? And they leave back a trail of uh, disease, uh, malaria, and uh, probably uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, defecation, open defecation that happened in, in these places. And they, they sort of went, went uh, you know, came back with uh, leaving all those places extremely dirty. Now, over the last few years, uh, there's been motivation of people, motivation of public resources, and also the bureaucracy and, and the people at large, you know, who've been brought into the fold uh, to look towards this. And there have been IT groups, you know, since Pune is such a large IT hubs, there have been IT groups who've been joining all that. So I see that as a wonderful example of without trying to tell the people what to do, uh, to motivate, mobilize, uh, bring in public private participation projects, which are very few in number, but help them look all in the same direction, okay, and achieve some degrees of success. I'm not saying that they've been completely transforming things, but wherever uh, there were alien things that came, where persons like Nitin Gadkari tried to come and say, that okay, I'll I'll make you large hubs, you know, where which can be used as truck terminuses at other times, and can be used by the workers uh, when they come and go there. And the workers said, hey, 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 stop, stop. We are not. Uh, what is their culture? What is our culture? And so please don't mix these things. Please not so fast. We don't want your posh, uh, you know, uh, palkita as they call them. We want something which is very basic. In fact, we don't want a building at all is what said the, the Naneshwar uh, Mauli kind of group said, we don't want that at all. So many times, you know, it is about understanding what the people want, what they do and what this whole thing is about. So while that entire exercise turned out to be partly an infrastructure development program where they have safer roads, they have uh, clean drinking water to drink, the toilets and the PWC said, PWD said, don't build toilets which we cannot manage later on. We are not going to take care of toilets. If you know, if we are, we are asked to take care of them for uh, 11 months with activities happening only for one month. So give it only to Sulab Saucharyas where they can be managed properly and over a long term. So I feel when we're looking at heritage, there's a, there's a need to look at it comprehensively uh, across a period of time, across generations and across the changes that are happening in a population. It is an extremely dynamic thing which is related to people. And if we understand these processes better, I think then we have to evolve 
the regulations and things that are in tune with that and which are agreeable to the people. You know? And it doesn't happen overnight. It has been 12 years, for example, this particular project. We're doing, we're doing the Chaniwarwada project for the last 30 years. You know, it's a long-term commitment is what is lacking in the Indian public place. The politician wants to pick up a few low-hanging fruits. The bureaucrat who is there for just two or three years, he also wants to pick up low-hanging fruits or probably wants to do good in some exceptional cases, uh, but leaves things uh, half done or undone or whatever it is. No? So I think it's a time to look completely in a different direction than what this uh, Ayaram Gayaram culture has left us with. Yeah, and and probably I also extend. Answered your question. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, of course, uh, of course, and and, and probably also you think that that I've I've learned the hard way. Yeah, and and I was going to say in in the case of the Varkaris, the discussion was far beyond tangible things because you're talking of music and literature and things that are just extraordinary uh, uh, gems of Indian culture which need yeah, other ways they, of documentation. Yeah, and they, they they tend to move you. They tend to really you know. Yeah touch uh, an inner part of you that, that identify, you can identify with very closely. And that is where I think uh, they happen to do that, you know, without being very vocal or uh, very being very uh, advertorial about it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to Divai. Divai really enjoyed your presentation. And I have two questions for you. You can take them in, you know, one by one, but I'm going to ask the same question I had asked Katie Ravindran, who I know is watching us here. So that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I've always, you, you, you were sort of questioning what happened in India after colonialism, at least that's the way I received your talk. And uh, I've always felt that the generation of at least architects and that practiced in India, the first generation of architects really did a lot of damage to us because, you know, they, on the one hand, they did some fantastic work, but it came at a very serious price that inundated the rubric completely. And you, you're absolutely right, I agree with you. I, I felt, and I still feel, that many of them spoke or continue to speak from two sides of their mouth. I mean, they pretend on the one hand, not pretend, I should say they probably genuinely enjoy all the heritage rubrics, but when you, you, you know, the rubber hits the road, they do things that are extremely questionable, at least for me, uh, but none of us have the guts to stand up and say anything about them. And, and this syndrome still continues. So I'd asked Katie in our last session, you know, where does urban design uh, and, and the sort of deeper issues of urban design really come into the picture and city planning come into the picture and why have we not had prominent voices that have challenged these people in public? That's question number one, okay? And then question number two is, uh, we'll take this one at a time, is you, you, you said a very wonderful thing. You said great projects like Nizamuddin Basti, which is a project all of us admire here, I know certainly I do, has not translated into policy, which is a fantastic observation. So I wanted to sort of change that a little bit and say, I, I would say great projects like Nizamuddin Basti have also not translated into precedent. I don't think people understand the method. I don't think they understand the depth of what has happened there. I don't think they've I don't think people have clarified the success stories and the failures so that we can use it in other places. Why is that not happening? And how do you see both these, you know, kind of, how do you see steps towards making this happen? So let's take them one at a time and answer it in any way you want. You're muted. Thank you, thank you, Vinay. I mean, these are quite complicated questions. I don't know, I'll try to do justice in the small period. Uh, when it comes to the, um, the voices against, I think there is no realization. Uh, and I think it's of this, that what they are doing, I think there is sort of a very ideological belief that modernism is the cure for everything. And that is sort of, the roots of that have gone much, much deeper. And I think there is, there is very few people who really question. And I think it's sort of stemming from architectural education. You know, I, I've been working on several uh, countries that have been colonized like Nepal, Cambodia, Vietnam, even Afghanistan. But the kind of um, sort of belief that our architects have for modernism, that is okay. But the kind of disbelief that they have for their own traditional architecture is amazing. I mean, even I mean, as an architect, <clears throat> I will also honestly cringe if somebody puts like a Mughal Jali on 
historic. I mean, not historic. I mean, even modern building, because you know we are all trained to be modernists, and that five-year training is. I mean, even when I'm in a conservation, I think if I look at a building with certain traditional uh, elements in it, I find it a bit in not acceptable to a certain degree. Few examples. I mean, I have a friend. I mean, it's a very successful architect, and recently we had a reunion, and he was very very proudly announcing that the project that he did 30 years ago, a very, very beautiful house in Chandigarh, he had been called back to demolish and rebuild. And I was like, my God, that was your first project. And you're telling me as if this is a achievement. I mean, wh why don't you restore it? And then you know, the client doesn't want or something. And there's a very famous uh, uncle of mine who recently, unfortunately died. And during his obituary, it was mentioned that the building that he did 50 years ago, one of the landmarks of Jodhpur, the first cinema hall, that he redesigned it as a modern mall. And it was a, it was a sort of told very proudly. So I think there is also an inherent deficiency in the way that we look at a particular, I mean, it's also related to certain temporal thing and the way we place culture and heritage in our system, uh, largely also stemming from the architectural education, uh, the Bauhaus um, system that we have uh, inherited and it continues. I mean, in Cambodia, they have a whole semester in architecture, bachelors, in which they are to design a building in traditional <clears throat> uh, technology and traditional style. I mean, I don't find it here. Even in Nepal, that is there. So they understand how an historic uh, architecture can be converted into a modern architectural vocabulary or character. Your second question on why these are not becoming precedences. And be, I mean, my simple answer is that they, all these projects sit outside the system. They're not integrated within the system. You know, some champion comes, he bulldozes into the system, collab, I mean, uh, collects these people and make them do these things. Left to the ASI, left to the MCD, left to the CPWD, they are not going to be taking these initiatives on their own. So you need an external force. And if that external force is there, those projects will be successful. If those external forces are not present, these projects will remain uh, isolated examples of thing. And that is exactly why I said that people don't tend to learn. These are not replicated and systems do not gear up to this. Because like heritage, I think we work in a very, very silo ways. And it's a very, I mean, it's also a colonial mentality of, um, you know, I own this and you own this and jurisdiction. And, and so this sort of partnership and collaborations, uh, the environment has not happened. So ASI will work on their own monuments. They will not like CPW to step in and likewise mm -hmm. an MCD. And also you have to, see that there is also three-tier governance. So there's central, state, and city. And many a times, creating partnership within them with uh, different political affiliations is almost an impossibility. So unless and until there's a system uh, is put in place which sort of encourages these things, it will be very difficult. I mean, it is to uh, replicate these examples. Uh, I will move to Ravindra. Ravindra, one line that stood out to me in your wonderful talk was, you said regulations when derived from people will work well. That is what you said, right? I, I, did I get you right there? Yes. yes. Um, reminded me of, you know, in the West, uh, we, we, we have Haussmann who was sort of blazing through Paris, designing boulevards, but in Venice, we had the people of Venice arguing that the the collapsed tower should be replicated on, you know, and the, and, and, and the replica of the tower is what you see today. It was a people's decision that was eventually taken up by the council. Now in India, unlike say the United States, participatory planning 
people's participation is not a legally required process. The only reason we do it in the United States, Ravindra, to be, to be honest with you, is it's, it's legally required. Every single pro uh, project, large or small, is it's legally mandated that we take it through a participatory process of some sort. So the question I have for you is, as somebody who is a very strong advocate for what I thought was you know, sort of bringing people into the coalition, that to think of heritage and conservation as a social enterprise, as a coalition building process. How do you see this kind of policy coming into the picture? I mean, are these things happening? I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Mumbai did pass a plan where I believe participatory planning was now mandatory. Malini will correct me if I'm wrong there, but I've heard that that was the first in India. Uh, are there other, thing hap other things happening like this and particularly on a smaller scale, maybe in villages or towns where we can begin to change the process through which we create policy and plans? <laughs> One, factually, it's incorrect in the sense uh, I happen to be a qualified planner. I don't know, I think I have some education in that. Uh, the planning legislation definitely requires public participation. Now, uh, how is exactly it is implemented uh, in the state is another issue. Because, but uh, without uh, public participation, no, none of the legislation, none of the acts can pass. Now the politicians and the bureaucrats find a way of doing it uh, where they, they do the needful and it is done and yet not done. So that's one. Secondly, when I said about public participation, I just made some notes on the side. Um, I'm of the very firm opinion, clear opinion. There are the, uh, the, the people's involvement as in a democratic process has very little space in accuracy of restoration and the authenticity of restoration, which also has a very large bearing on the, the whole thesis we're we are talking about, which is the why conserve at all. So let's say we're talking about a conservation at a settlement level or regional level or a national level. That pre-decides, uh, predetermines one fundamental value, which is authenticity. So, which I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm quite shocked that in my years of seminaring and webinaring, uh, I, I mean, I found that the authenticity is only taken as a little bit of a lip service, where most people even sort of almost believe that it's okay not to be so authentic so long as conservation goes along. I can't understand this. I would rather say you lose more, but learn the authentic methods. So there are two ways of it, like, you know, bottom up and a top down approach. Uh, possibly you could look this as a bottom up approach. So if you don't inculcate the practices of uh, uh, the exactitude of the conservation techniques in, uh, at, a, at a brick and mortar level, I can't see the value of doing that at a planning level of making drawings saying this is a protected zone, et cetera, et cetera and you regulate everything except the building itself, period. Secondly, regarding coming to the, the public participation and the law coming from the society, um, and obviously the, even the British planning acts start from public participation. So nobody is inventing a wheel. It's just that how your, your question of, is it being done? Answer, plain no. At city level, village level, whatever level, absolutely not. There's no way it's happening. Now, if you ask me why it is happening because of extreme gentrification, it's very obvious. So people even, if I, am, I sit across my house, there's a village across, um, they, don't, they have no, I mean, they're not even allowed to participate in it. So highly Sanskritized uh, field. So in plain, simple words, public participation is a, an aspiration, but it will be miles and miles away from it. I was mainly interested in this question because what I've observed in India is public reaction, but not participation. Forgive my factual mistake there, but you know we, we are great in India to react after a lot of things are done, but we have never seen the public kind of invited or uh, you know sort of participating in a, in a very serious way. Perhaps it is skepticism, I don't know, but it continues to intrigue me. Uh, Ashley, I'm gonna to move to you 
And my sort of, I was very intrigued with your sort of uh, approach where you talked about a kind of, um, you know, almost a, a tarnished view of colonialism as Manish sort of alluded. And I wanted to uh, ask you the question in a different way. You emphasize the Taj Mahal a lot, for instance. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the Taj Mahal's garden at the back was, you know, designed by the colonials at the end of the day. In fact, Taj Mahal is standing today because they decided not to demolish it. Um, I could go on and on. So my question to you was really about, instead of, well, one is leveling the playing field where, as Manish alluded, uh, and, and since, again, in Goa, we have this uh, sort of a dominant rubric places like Goa, Pondicherry, certainly, where the colonial architecture is really so dominant, particularly in towns that are designed from scratch by the colonials. These are completely seamless heritages today, uh, in, in, at least in what one aspect, and at least in places like Goa, uh, you know, they've com sort of completely dissolved into the ethos. But my question was different. When you look at places like this, Taj Mahal, colonial histories, et cetera, if you shift the discourse from their origins to their contemporary condition, Taj Mahal, for example, raises questions that are far beyond the building or the Mughal identity. Um, I mean, for me, the most important question around the Taj Mahal is the river, because if the river is not going to be restored, the foundations of the Taj Mahal are going to become loose and we may not see the Taj Mahal over the next number. I and mean, this is well known now. So where I'm going with this is, is there a where planning, the intersection of planning and heritage in the context of what you discussed is really about broadening the conservation rubric through planning context that we, we, we go far beyond the object and we look at places in their, in their space-time sort of condition today. And what that leads me to is the question of something you said, which I really appreciated, was the, was the idea that we now talk, whether it's step dwells or other things, we begin to look at many other aspects that need to be excavated, hydro systems, indigenous infrastructures, the, the rituals that go around them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what this boils down to for me is going beyond the mainstream dominant examples of conservation that are out there in the media. Does this suggest to you as an educator, particularly uh, Professor Ashley, that scholarship begins to become an important idea. And that scholarship is about really excavating constantly these lesser known aspects, uh, other, other positions, other ways of looking at things, and then perhaps even taking a greater responsibility of not keeping it within the institution, but finding methods of disseminating it into the actors that are actually on the ground shaping these realities. So two questions. How do you see the role of scholarship in this idea of, of broadening conservation and conservation policy? And how do you see methods of bringing it beyond the Institute? Because it's very easy for all of us as professors to come up with these positions. Well, I'm not saying it's easy, but relatively, but how do you get it to the actors that are actually going to make it happen in reality? Professor Ashley, are you there? Yeah. Ah, yeah. go ahead. We can hear you now. Thank you. It's a very interesting question. Complicated though. Uh, basically, to me, scholarship exists not only in us. I mean, we feel that we are, because you we went to university and so on, that we are scholars. We are not scholars. We actually don't know anything. Whereas the village would might know more that we, we know because we, we tend to be very arrogant in our elitist uh, sort of makeup and so on. So I, I think that we have a lot more to learn from the people on the ground, the people who are working, the people who are in the villages. I mean, they can teach us much more about conservation that we know about conservation. You know, we, we I, I'm, I'm very worried about myself as well because I'm, I'm an elitist to some extent. I, I think I know everything about conservation. I don't, but I am trying to sort of tell people what to do. That's one of the problems. So, the role of scholarship is actually not university education, but like uh, some people like uh, Malini and all. It's actually getting on the ground and dirtying your hands. Okay, the fact that buildings 
no we we are living in a very artificial world where we are trying to preserve things which may not be there in 25 30 years they may be all gone so what are we trying to do is it this very artificial requirement that we have to keep everything that we have to make sure that things exist forever that they're all pyramids that we have to keep forever no i mean buildings have a life and if you look at tradition over a long period of time there was a change i, I mean i don't think that could be a final master plan for example you know master plans can never be final so what are we trying to do we're trying to put everything in cotton wool and preserve it because of some to some extent because of our arrogance right but what happens in the Taj Mahal in 50, 100 years? I mean, there'll be enough pollution on it to destroy it completely. The river going dry would be a problem and so on and so forth. So I, I think we have to relook at this debate again. I think we're all stuck in a situation where we're trying to preserve things which we actually have no control about. You know, we are, it's, it's an artificial preservation that we are involved in at the moment. So what is the future? of conservation. I'm not trying to be negative about this. It's something that has worried me for the last 50 years as to what, what we are doing, you know. For example, how do we preserve something forever? We can't. Buildings have a life. Towns have a life. So after some time, there may not be anything. So what are we trying to do? So I, I think this debate should be looked at slightly differently and maybe we should sit and talk about this thing, you know, or what the future lies, you know, for for a building or for a landscape. Yeah, and if you look at India, for example, I mean, it has a history of thousands of years and there must have been lots of changes that took place, you know. And what we're looking at today is something that we saw happen a hundred years ago. That's all. Or maybe the temples maybe three, 400 years or 500 years ago, or even a thousand years ago, you know, but can we actually protect them forever? We can't. So that's an issue. So what do we do? Right? Maybe we have to enjoy it while it stands. And then what it, watch it go. Because there's nothing that is permanent, for example, I can't see a permanent building anywhere. Pyramids were, were done to last uh, so many years, but that's also disintegrating. It's a problem. All our monuments will disintegrate in the next 50 to 100 years. There won't be anything left. We'll be artificially trying to prop it up. We'll be artificially trying to uh, secure it as a conservation thing, but it will be gone. So what is the, what is the issue? At that point, I think scholarship just stops. You know, it cannot go beyond that because uh, I I don't think the ASA can produce anything that will go on forever. No, neither can India. You know, we we are just enjoying what we have at the moment, and that's basically what it is. And uh, I mean, I I I actually cannot see a permanent solution for conservation. Neither can I see a permanent solution for a master plan. A master plan evolves. It's a dynamic process. It changes. It can be something very different tomorrow. It can be very different in 50 years' time. Maybe the next generation that comes may not want any of these. They might say, look, let's destroy, because now they're on social media and so on. They might say, let's destroy everything. Put high rises. You know? And, and let's go underground and live underground or something. Like that. I don't know. So I'm also caught up in this huge uh, trying to understand what this is all about you know because i i cannot see having worked on 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 sort of monuments which are also to maybe 200 2000 years old and so on professor actually one, one if i may interrupt you one of the things i wanted to ask you is basically this is great but 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 you've alluded to a lot of things what i wanted to ask you really is you know say for instance you do learn something from a villager because you know you are a Forget the elite part. You, you Say you just have the intelligence to absorb what a villager is really telling you and others don't. So say you're learning all these wonderful wisdoms that allow you to see things that a lot of other people are not. Question to you is, is it possible for the education community to begin to become 
interesting, unique liaisons to fill the gaps that are not happening? Can we as professors, scholars, writers, thinkers, you know, not take ourselves in the elitist position that we are cut off from society, but become the agents that can disseminate the knowledge to the people that, that really will be using this heritage every day. Do people actually know the, the value of the river for the Taj Mahal? Uh, do, do they understand the importance of Fatehpur Sikri? Do they understand the beauty of the beautiful Buddhist temples you have in your nation? Can we become the agents? That's really what I was trying to get at. No, actually, um... I mean, I, I understand your question, but for example, if you if you look at now, let's look at a stupa, for example. Uh, I'm I'm now taking a stupa, a Buddhist temple in Sri Lanka, which is those mounds that you see. Now, the authenticity, for example, for that was a very tiny thing in the middle. Kings that came later just rebuilt the top. They just kept adding to it, you know. So what you see today is something that has about five, six layers on top of it. But the authenticity was never touched, right? Now, if you look at excavation, for example, I mean, having worked in excavation, I think it's an absolutely destructive process because the symbolism that was established to set up that thing, which went on for seven days, 14 days, and so on, is completely destroyed when you excavate, you know, because you can never replace, you can conserve it. So that's what I'm trying to say. Conservation becomes an artificial thing. It, it actually doesn't preserve, really preserve what is there. Very you good. Know? We're going to move on because of yeah. time. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to move to Manish. We have to take Manish. I mean, of course, I know we're, we're short of time, but Manish is important. <laughs> and, uh, I can, so Manish, I can go real quick. When I, uh, no, no, you I, don't have to go real quick. You, you should take your time just like everyone else. Okay. If people have to leave, they can leave. Uh, the, the important thing is you have the unique position of having a, a, a special vantage point compared to many of the panelists, as you rightly said. Uh, in the United States, there, there's a lot of debate going on about conservation, probably more than many of the other disciplines. And we are beginning to realize that in the name of you know, diversity, which has now come, become a very important aspect, particularly in the Institute, uh, that our profession of heritage, heritage conservation is not really reflecting the diversity of the work that, that it needs to be that needs to be done. I mean, it's simply not. The methods are not diverse enough. The voices are not diverse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is exacerbated the moment you come to a place like India. All of the panelists have said that in one way or the other. Second, a very important point you made was about incentivized planning. And this is a point I want you to elaborate on, that you, you, you basically said that you're, from a sort of a distant standpoint, you feel, you call it the carrot. Uh, that whether it is FSI increase or density increase or whatever it is, tax incentives, some, that incentivized planning has a place. And we've had a lot of success stories in the US in, in making this happen. In your experience, do you see this in other, in other ways playing around in India that may begin to circumvent or even advantage, take advantage of many of the methods that have not worked in the Indian context as far as conservation is concerned? Could you talk a little bit about your experience or your thoughts about even speculatively of how you see this? Right, okay. Those are loaded questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, as you as you pointed out, you know, uh, much of heritage in the U.S. Is also is uh, uh, elitist. Uh, continues to further the histories of uh, uh, mostly straight white men uh, at the cost of everyone else, pretty much, including women. Um, so, you know, uh, histories of, of course, the indigenous peoples and all the immigrants, uh, communities, they have to take a back seat because uh, white supremacy is foundational in um, both planning and preservation. And uh, the National Register, which is the repository of, uh, of uh, properties in, in the U.S., has about over 95,000 entries, and I believe only 10% are, uh, you know, uh, of those are associated with the minority communities. So this, you can understand how, how skewed that system is because the whole apparatus is set to further that. And I see that in India as well, uh, because, you know, uh, I do not see histories and memories of women, uh, especially in India being furthered through preservation. I don't see histories and memories of Dalit properties being further through it. It's so class-based even, you know, some of my work in Mumbai around Girangar, 
is you know uh, it's so class based uh, much of uh, the interventions in the historic fabric as uh, as somebody mentioned probably vinayak is is that you know the reuse is around museums and yes they're interpreting the uh, the cotton mills in gurgaon which was as many of you know manchester of the east but none of the histories of the people in the communities who worked there who lived there who you know had very vibrant uh, uh, communities is is being interpreted through that right much of the reuse is fancy malls and museums and so on and so forth so so we have to work on class here how is how does preservation become representative uh, of all religions all cultures all classes uh, all genders that is my my thing i don't know this again is is a very long range process it will take time for it to unfold um the other question is you know incentivizing as you know when i you i know that you know after the passage of the Na national historic uh, preservation act in 1966 in in us uh uh there was some sort of push to engage with preservation because like i said every state had to create a state historic preservation office and try to integrate preservation in the master plan and and do documentation and other types of work and then work with the municipalities to further preservation at the local level but there was not so much private initiative in preservation until the tax credits kick in in the 80s where you could you know where you could take, get tax breaks for all the restoration work around properties that were not just on the national register but also eligible for the national register so i and i was reading i believe it's fitch who said that you know it brought a lot of people into the business of preservation they were not just into it for the love of history they were just there to you know carve a livelihood make a living and you know and and benefit from preservation so uh, so there is the stick model which is the historic district model which is you know in the us where even the color of uh, a door trim frame if you have to change it has to go through a review process it's a very tedious model uh, where you know it frustrates the uh, property owners but then the carrot model is you know more relaxed uh, it says you know the the more you preserve the more incentives you can get in terms of you know an additional cottage in the back and some far and so on and so forth so the point that i was making when i and i don't know how to how to un unpack it more is that we need to work on the carrot model here so that we can bring preservation out of the uh, the 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 trenches of tourism uh, slash economic development because all it 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 merges with economic development around tourism but i don't see it merging much beyond that so we need to somehow think about carrots that you know people middle class people who own uh, a small uh, store in uh, uh, panaji or some you know pondicherry don't feel the pressure to sell it but they can just keep it going themselves and and that would also control for gentrification i think uh, as well and not all places would become elitist and woven around you know tourism and fab india would not be opening its stores there but it would be more real uh, and people would then be connected mm -hmm. with the brick and mortar which is i think the most important thing I don't know how the degree to which I answered your question, but oh, that's yeah. all good. It's very good. Um, I think we have to wind up, and I, I know that, so I'm going to conclude. Unfortunately, I would love to go for another round, but uh, so no, I think we bring this together, and then I'll pass it on to Punam. Uh, since we are talking about the nexus between conservation and planning, uh, I think my final line would basically be what all of you really, at least what I've concluded from all of you, is if we all begin to think that cities are not uh, physical places but actually events in time they are you know whimsical places that keep changing and perhaps more importantly cities are in a constant process of remodeling which means that whether you're a lay person whether you're an architect civil engineer conservationist whatever we are if you get out of our silos and begin to say you know at any place where you arrive if you ask the question what is already there that needs to remain i think we've all become conservationists in one sense or the other so at the end of the day we are all conservationists and i'm particularly saying this to architects with a capital a of which i am one many of you are that you know pretend to think that we can do whatever the hell we want but as as our as our uh, experts here have talked about today there are many other nuanced aspects that i hope will come into the forefront 
of the Indian discourse as we think of the next few years or what Indian cities will be. I'll pass it on to you, Punam, and thank you all the panelists for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Vinayak, and I just thank wanted to thank react uh, to one aspect that uh, we are just reacting that just kind of struck a chord to me because my own experience in Goa, uh, when we were doing village plan, uh, I was a facilitator taking a plan and just because village of Para wanted to do their village plan and we just guided that process. And you won't believe that people were actually able to not only mark their own places of uh, sentiments and uh, green areas and, and rivers and where their roads should come, but they even marked their banyan trees to be preserved. So it's not about just being reactionary. Today we are about participation, but that participation sometimes is not allowed to us by powers to be, and that has to be said. And this conversation becomes more important because there are more people saying, that we do need participation and perhaps the education part of it, of us being facilitators from the ground up or from top down, it is us being facilitators that is not enough said in our education system. We as in who are privileged enough to get the education, be in this forum and be able to speak to each other. I think this is what is going to pave way. But there is sensibility, there is willingness, and there is enough voices now to participate in the process. That I wanted to just bring back. And I'm very grateful um, to all of you. And now I would request Kirti ji, we did exceed <laughs> a lot more um, to, and thank you very much for, for being here and for this platform. Thank you, enjoyed it.